I'd like to announce my new book, How to Be Happy, St. Thomas's Secret to a Good Life. Although just about every marketing firm, self-help guru, and man on the street has an answer, very few, if any, understand true happiness. It doesn't come from power, pleasure, popularity, or possessions. So what is happiness, and how do we find it? In How To Be Happy, I rely on the help of St. Thomas Aquinas to show what will and won't bring us happiness in this life. My hope is that by making the thought of Aquinas accessible for today, my new book will be a helpful guide to a good life. Check the link in the description of this video to get your copy today. Good. G'day, Father Sean Kilcoley. How are you doing, Matt? It's great to be with you. It's great to have you here. Um, Sunday. I don't usually do Sunday live streams, but did today. But why not? You're in town. This is one of the advantages of living in Steubenville. You have all these fantastic people who are dropping in and texting you. <laughs> I don't mean to capitalize on our friendship, but you have a lot of wisdom to share. So I'm really glad to be able to both catch up with you and have people sort of watch in. Absolutely. So why are you here? What conference were you at? So I was at the Veritas Amoris conference, which is uh, was put on by Dr. Stephen Hildebrand, who's on faculty at at the university. And um, and the, so the Veritas Amoris project is is uh, their website is veritasamoris.org, and and it's really all of the teachers who taught me in grad school, who have started this project with three really main goals in their scope. Right, the uh, the theology of the body, John Paul II. Theology of Love of Pope Benedict XVI, and Pope Francis's Pedagogy of Accompaniment. And so it's really to preserve the treasury of the church's teaching on marriage and family, and and really keeping in mind those three perspectives. And, um, and it was just an amazing experience to be there because uh, it really took me back to my own time in Rome, and, and I was just filled with so much joy. Um, but also my heart was just really burning over the, the whole weekend because um, because a lot of the work that I've done over the last, you know, seven or eight years has really been about those three things. It's, it's been about like teaching the theology of the body and Benedict the 16th theology of love in a way that can facilitate, we'll yep, sorry. right. In a way that can facilitate, um, healing and accompaniment and walking somebody out of the darkness toward the light of Christ. And, uh, and so, so it was just an experience for me where I felt like I found a home and, and, I don't know. I'm just like filled with joy about the whole thing right now. Do you find so. that when you come out of conferences into the real world, you forget that not everyone's super happy? You know, like you go to the <laughs> airport, you're like, hi, because that's what you're used to doing at the conference because everyone's so jazzed. And then you're like, oh, right, we're back to. I mean, it, it may be a little bit like that. Uh, my joy, my, my goal is to work on my interior happiness over the last, you know, 10 or 15 years, 10 or 15 months. You know, COVID has really been a time of a lot of healing in, in my own life, in my own heart. And, and um, so my goal is just to find peace with Christ every single day, and, uh, like and he's goal. delivering. So. so were these people, you said that they taught you uh, in Rome, yeah. were they the professors or the lecturers at this particular conference? They were. So they these were. were people who taught you and now you're teaching alongside of them. Had, is there any of them that you hadn't seen since Rome? Uh, yeah, several of them I hadn't seen since Rome. And so, and, and I, I didn't give a paper or anything. I went as a participant and, uh, and really all JP2 grads from the United States were, were invited uh, to come. And... Um, but but I'm always like I, I just have such um, gratitude for academics and the work that they do um, because they really are. I, I think the image that came to mind was Morris Laetitia 291, where it says that although she constantly holds up the call to perfection and asks for a fuller response to God, right? That's what we do. We we hold up the call to perfection and ask for a fuller response to God. The church must accompany with attention and care the weakest of her children who show signs of a wounded and troubled love, like a beacon of a lighthouse in a port or a torch carried among the people to enlighten those who have lost their way or who are in the midst of a storm. And, and, and I was thinking about how like those professors, they really are the ones who who let the light shine into the darkness of my own heart when I was in grad school. And, and that the light of truth and the truth of love, as I came to learn it in grad school, it, it really showed me where those places or privations of love were in my own story, um, which was incredibly painful, but also in, turned out to be incredibly healing. Mm. And, um, and, and so I sort of think of them as, as the ones who light the torch 
and uh, and I found myself in my pastoral work to be the person who like carries the torch to yeah. enlighten those who have lost their way, and um, and it's always refreshed. That, that's so beautiful. It's such a lovely so, quote from Pope Francis because I think that sometimes there's this temptation to be like, whoever's in the A team. Let's go and let's just cut off the rest of them because mm-hmm. they're dead weight. And those who are serious, they're going to come with me. But everybody else, you know, right. get serious or get out. Yeah. I'm so glad that the church as a whole doesn't view us like that. <laughs> well, exactly. And uh, I think I think it's always easier, too, when I recognize that I'm the one who's lost my way a lot of times. You know, and, and I need um, like I need other people to enter into my life and, and, and to I don't know, just cast the light into the darkness. And, um, and then we learn how to do that with others, you know, how to do what, how to do the same thing, how to bring the light of Christ into others, you know, like it's, it's like, like we learn to be Christ-like, not by watching him and imitating what he does. We learn to be Christ-like by experiencing him and what he does. Ah, that's a great. And then doing for others what he's done for us. Yeah, Yeah, even just today I was at Holy Mass and the priest said something like, you know, here are the three ways that the devil poisons a family, right? It was like pride, envy, ingratitude, something something else. Maybe it was four ways. But as I was listening, I I realized that I was thinking, I hope they're listening to this, you know, like my kids, you know, Mm -hmm. and not kind of receiving that myself. I don't know if that's because I'm something of a teacher that I often wonder how other people are receiving something. Or if this mm-hmm. is just what we all do as humans, we, we get given advice and you think, yeah, that person should take this <laughs> as opposed to receiving what Christ wants for you first right. and then going going out. Right. I do the same thing. You know, I totally do the same thing. And um, it, and it's it's oftentimes hard to, to recognize, uh, okay, this is for me right now. Mm. And, uh, and and I, I just had the most amazing experience on, on retreat recently. Um, like it was Corpus Christi Sunday. It was my last Sunday in, in a parish before I move. And, and I've been living with the same priest for like seven months. And, uh, and, and he's a guy I've known for 19 years. And so it's really nothing against anybody I've ever lived with, but it's the first time I've ever lived with somebody that I was really friends with for, yeah. for like ever in my priesthood. And, and so I drove him to the airport because he was going on vacation and I was going to move and I dropped him off and I'm driving away. And all of a sudden I have this like feeling in my heart, like this like emptiness and, and kind of like this, bleh, like, like something's wrong mm-hmm. and I can't figure out what's wrong. You know, I'm making phone calls. I'm trying to call friends, I'm trying to check in with people. I call my family. And, and then it dawned on me that I missed him. Mm. And, uh, and I was like, oh, that's, that's right. That's what this, that's what that feeling is. It's, it's, I miss him. And, and, I, and I realized I probably haven't let myself feel that for a very, 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 very long time. And, uh, and then I was kind of excited about having that feeling. And then I went on a retreat and I sat down with our Lord and I was like, I need to start with like missing my friend, Father Lee. And then Jesus just kind of said, Sean, that's how I feel about you. And, you know, that's how I felt about you on days that you didn't come to pray. That's how I felt about you on days in your past when you were zoning out on television. Or that's how I felt about you when you were living in a sinful life. And that's how I felt about you when you just, like, I didn't care about life that day. And, like, that's how I feel about you. And and it opened up this horizon of, of just growing in friendship with him and, and letting him like finish up healing like so many things in my life mm. and um and, and so kind of to the point that uh, like sometimes we forget that it's about us you know and and if we remember it's about us then like our lord can do so much and uh and and he really desires to do so much mm. what's the status because you mentioned the theology of the body earlier and i know that's a uh-huh. big part of your ministry what's the status of the theology of the body and i, I ask that because it felt like when i was coming into the faith um the the the, the the false news was that Catholics were down on sex, right? And then mm-hmm. here's this Pope who's really teaching us how to be human, looking at sex as a gift and all that. Um, and it kind of helped us respond and does help us respond to sort of uh, the sexual revolution and its fruits. Um, but it does feel today that we, we it, for whatever is the case, it feels like at least here where I am in, in the United States that the church feels like it's dividing, right? And you've got people who want to get really serious about the faith and that sometimes shows itself as this intense traditionalism and i'm not accusing traditional catholics of doing this but i do think that within that camp you find people who are trying to 
question or throw out things that we never thought to question or throw out before. Like people who were like, well, St. Faustina, she was a fraud. You're like, whoa, mm -hmm. who's, why are people saying that now? Same thing, or John Paul II, you know, he was, he was a, you know, whatever, in many respects, just like a liberal modernist, all right? Not a lot of people say this, but mm -hmm. some people do. Sure. And I imagine there's a big chunk of traditionalist Catholics who are now just throwing shade on theology of the body, not wanting to give it a hearing, wanting to dismiss it altogether. I've certainly encountered that. Have you encountered that? And, and where, what is the status of the theology of the body? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if I know the status of theology of the body. I think, I think that generally the church is very divided right now. And, and I think that many people have been hurt by the church. And, and so, so that really does a lot of damage, you know, and like the damage of scandals in the church is twofold, right? Like there's this, this demon of abuse that has wreaked havoc in the church. We can't deny that. We have to admit that it happened. It's happened to people in my own family. But that demon always brings this other demon, which is this demon of muteness with him. And which is what? What's that? Muteness. Like kind of we can't talk. rebellion. I can't talk. Like I'm mute. Oh, I can't okay. talk. Muteness. I don't right. talk about it. We don't talk about it. We pretend like it never happened. Okay. And and so. So then, what happens is we don't talk about sex at all, because of the fact that we have a shameful history. And. And so, so this proposal to talk about our sexuality becomes scary for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. and, and it can be scary on two ends of the spectrum, right? So sometimes it's scary for traditionalists because they want to just do things like we've always done them. Oftentimes they want to do things like we've, like we've always done them. Um, like a lot of the traditionalists that I know, and, and I know a lot, and, and I have dear friends, um, they, like sometimes there are people in, in that population who have been really hurt, but they don't really want to talk about it, and, and they want to go to Mass and pray, and they want silence, and they want structure, and, and that's all good for them. Um, but they don't, they're not always comfortable doing something new. And, um, and so, so, so it really is, is kind of a, a strange dynamic. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you know, a lot of times it, it's really like school administrators or pastors who don't want to talk about theology of the body or chastity. And, and a lot of time that's fear because they're afraid in some way it will be construed as a grooming process or something. When really what it's doing is it's informing people so that those things don't happen anymore. And, and, and so fear always is from the evil one. And, and I think on both ends of the spectrum, you, you have fear. And, and the only, the thing that casts out fear is perfect love casts out fear. And, and theology of the body is a message of perfect love and it and really should be the antidote for that division and, and something that can heal that division. And, and I really believe it can, you know, when done well. And, and so I think you find things all over the spectrum, you know, like there's school systems that are using Rua Woods theology of the body curriculum. Mom, Monica Ashour has her curriculum that she made through the theology of the body evangelization team. Um, in our own diocese, we rewrote our curriculum and we have theology of the body starting in like kindergarten and age appropriate at every grade. And we start talking about what to do if you see pornography in fourth grade. Um, and so there are pockets of people that are, that are trying to do something new and, and we live in a new culture. <clears throat> you know, we live in a world that's different. I'd like to announce my new book, How to Be Happy. That's okay. Okay. Did we just cut off the last several minutes or something? Or? 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Okay. All right. All right. So we live in a world that was different than the one we were raised in. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, parents have a different responsibility. And the church has a different responsibility in terms of like how we equip families to navigate the hypersexualized culture. Yeah. You and I met because we were talking about pornography a lot. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like a weird small boat of people that are trying to help people mm -hmm. overcome pornography. This must have been like five or six, maybe more years ago, do you think? I think it's close to seven. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. And uh, I just remember being really blessed by a lot of the things that you had to say. How much of that was influenced by the theology of the body? And then how much of that was processed by like your own kind of journey of healing? Yeah. Yeah. So, so my own... You know, and, I, and every time I give a talk, I kind of talk about, you know, the family I came from where, you know, both of my parents were divorced when they married and they married each other and they both had children. And then I was born. My mom died. My dad remarried, had more children. And, 
And so I sort of grew up in a family where I had three groups of siblings, and, and it really it, it provoked a lot of questions about my own identity and, and things like that. I found a lot of refuge in the church at, at a very young age and, and really was faithful from a young age. Um, but I did see pornography when I was about 11. Uh, I did see a pornography video when I was about 14. Um, high school never really had a problem with it. And then I went to college, and after my parents' divorce, you know, as often happens, kind of like, I don't really know who I am right now, and pornography was available, and it just became a coping mechanism for me, you know? So I do have that in my history. And um, and then I went to the seminary, and, and you know, you kind of go through the seminary, and, and you find some healing along the way. And... Um, and, and then when I went to graduate school in Rome, uh, it was really studying the entirety of the church's teaching on marriage, family, and human sexuality that, that awakened in me where my wounds were. <laughs> and, uh, and, and it was such a blessing, and, but, a, but it was a blessing that was painful, right? So like year three, of, I was in Rome, I was super depressed, and, and I, I realized I had to make this choice, right? I can either like shove all these emotions down because I have no idea why I'm depressed, throw myself into my work, become yeah. like a really good academic curmudgeonly priest who doesn't like people <laughs> or take a risk to have joy. Right. And the risk to have joy means like, okay, I'm going to confront my life and I'm going to confront my life in truth. And, and that means I need help doing that. And, and so I, I asked the Bishop to send me to therapy and then our Lord started to unfold for me the truth about my own story, but also the truth about where he was in my own story. And, and so so this elongated healing process leads to me going back to the diocese and um and i'm just filled with gratitude for what our lord has done for me you know like every day in the magnificat we say the almighty has done great things for me mm -hmm. and uh and so how do i give back or, or what am i going to do with the gift he's given me and sort of looking at the landscape well like there's a ton of marriage prep programs coming out right now that's covered there's a lot of people talking about theology of the body generally speaking that's covered yeah um, there's like some divorce programs that already exist. Okay, that's covered. Nobody's talking about pornography really using theology of the body. Hmm. Uh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> and so I just did a theology of the body class, and then like five people came to me for help with pornography. Hmm. And, and so it was really a response to the people who were coming to me asking for help. And, and our Lord did that, and, and that led me to have to get more training and... And so, so a couple of years ago, I finished uh, pastoral sexual addiction practitioner certification through the International Institute for Trauma and Addictions Professionals, and um, and and it's really just been something that's taken up a lot of my time because it gets the most common sin that we face in the church, right? It's it's statistically it's half of the people in church, which means half of the people in church are enslaved to sin. They're not in relationship with our Lord, and nobody likes living a double life. And, and so my zeal is about helping people live in integrity and to not live a double life because our Lord wants more for you and, and you can have more. And, uh, and it's been a blessing to see transformation. You know, we become priests so that we can see the blind see and the lame walk and, and heal people. And I get to see that all the time because of this work. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it's an incredible gift. And, and, and it's been a blessing to to be able to do conferences for other priests in order to teach them what I know or, or pass on some of what I know, so that they can better help their people. And and so so I really like it's, it's important to me that the way I spend my time is like I'm going to teach people how to fish. I'm not going to go fishing for them. Mm -hmm. And um, and watching that bear fruit is also something that gives me a lot of joy. You know, like whenever I see somebody else that's like got a ministry that's doing going well or or, or, you know, they're doing something amazing in their parish. It just fills me with joy because, mm -hmm. um, because that means there's more people out there building up the kingdom, you know, and being a light that shines in the darkness or being the perfect love that casts out fear. It feels like over the last 10 years, I think the way I have at least begun speaking about pornography and helping people from be free of pornography is sort of very different to how I would have 10 years ago. You know, the advice I would mm -hmm. have given back then is very different, maybe even you know, longer than that. And that's in part because we now walk around with phones in our pockets right, in a way that right, we right. didn't before, computer phones as it were. So yeah, I guess I'd just be interested in just sort of saying, okay, somebody comes to you and they say, I look at pornography. Where, mm -hmm. do, you, where do you go from there? What's the sort of advice you give today from what you've learned? 
So, uh, so if somebody has a problem, like typically I'm going to ask them some initial assessment questions, like, uh, how frequently is it happening? Um, how old were you when you're exposed? Uh, and what have you already done to try to quit? Hmm. Right. Because, because there's, everybody has a different path in, you know, there, there's multiple kinds of pornography addiction, right? Some people have a behavior problem, which is basically like maybe they're 16 they start looking at bra and underwear ads in the Sears catalog and masturbating. They realize after a few months, like, this is not right. I'm, I, need, I can't do this anymore. And they want to quit. That person typically can, like, go to confession, have a more structured prayer life, and they can stop. <clears throat> now, somebody else who saw extremely hardcore pornography when they were 10. <clears throat> they always looked at pornography when their parents were fighting and their parents didn't have a secure relationship with them. It went on until they were 30. Then they get caught by their spouse. Like that person's gonna need a different strategy. Or the person who was sexually abused when they were younger, or maybe they were sexually abused by a peer. And especially among men, it's it's hard to admit when that happened, you know? And, and sometimes it's like, you know, were you sexually abused? No. Like, did you ever like, you know, play doctor with your cut? Well, yes, I did that. And, okay, okay. so there's, there's like contact that happened when you were younger. Like when that's in their history, sometimes there's so much shame around that, that like they need to go to a trauma therapist. And, and so there's really, everybody's path is different. It's sort of like getting lost in the woods and the only way out is to backtrack the way you got in. Hmm. And, and so like looking at our stories is really important. Hmm. And so I might ask like, what have you done to stop? And, and if they say something like, you know, well, well, I'm like praying the rosary, I'm doing this devotions and I'm going to confession a lot. Okay. Have you tried going to a 12 step group? And, and I, and I've really come to a place where I promote 12 step fellowships a lot because a couple of reasons. One it's, it's the one place I know they can walk in the room and somebody hasn't looked at porn or masturbated for 15 years and that's sitting in the room. <laughs> Who would have thought that you have to go you know, to an essay group to find that person, I, right? I realize <laughs> that. Maybe there are people in the church who haven't masturbated in 15 years. They just don't talk about it. They sure, just don't sure, tell anybody. Sure. Um, but you know they had a problem and they've been free for like 15 years. And, and so they know the path, you know, and they've seen everything before. And, yeah. and you're not gonna go in there and think I'm a special case, you know, like I'm a special case, like, like and it might work for you guys, but I'm special. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and so nobody's a special snowflake in, in that room. Yeah. And, um, and, and it's just been powerful. And, and I've seen people and their spiritual life just gets rebooted there, right? It gets rebooted, mm. you know, sometimes the, the resistance is that, well, it's not Catholic, so it's not good. And I would say, like, it's really good pre-evangelization for anyone. And it would be really good pre-evangelization for a Catholic to work the 12 steps before, like, RCIA. Wow. You know? Like, what if your RCIA sponsor said to you, okay, I'm gonna, I want you to call me every single day, and what's the major sin in your life that gets in the way of, of your relationship with Jesus? We're going to just work on that. So you're going to call me every day, and you're going to check in about how you're doing that, and I'm going to have you do inventories about your life, wow. and we're really going to surrender everything to our Lord when you enter into the church. What if your sponsor treated you like that? That's amazing. Yeah. It would be amazing yeah. if our RCI sponsor acted like a 12-step sponsor. Yeah. Um, and, and so it's really, it's an, it's an incredible gift that, um, that so many people don't take advantage of because mm. of fear. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and so, so I, I really, and I've seen people be free there. You know, I've seen people be free there. You know, I've have seen- Have you run groups? How I've run my own groups. I, I started running my own group, and it was really like a, a check-in group, um, kind of like doing group spiritual direction check-in group, and a place to like share. Um, but I, I have to say that um, a lot of times people who go to twelve-step groups did better than going to the group that I was running. Because again, like in that mm. group, there's not a lot of sobriety in the room and not a lot of experience in the room. And it was really dependent on me being there. And I think there's a gift to, to having a priest who's willing to be present to you. And, and if we all had a lot of time, we could, we could yeah. do that. As I started to travel more, I wasn't able to be as present. And 12-step and, and groups just got a structure that can run on its own. Are there different types of Sexaholics Anonymous 12-step groups? And which one do you prefer? So there is Sexaholics Anonymous. Sobriety definition is... No sex with anyone except for my wife or husband, including myself. Yeah. Right. So it's that's Catholic moral yeah, teaching, yeah, yeah. right? 
Sex Addicts Anonymous is um, basically people define their own sobriety using the three circles boundary plan, right? The three circles boundary plan, a lot of people know about it. Mm -hmm. Focus uses it. Um, I have a video on my YouTube channel mm -hmm. of how it works. And, and so you might have people in that room who would say, well, I can masturbate on occasion if I'm choosing to do it on that day, right? So I don't do it compulsively. Right. I make a date with myself and yeah. that's when I do it, you know? Ugh. And I know people who have tried that and they're just like, yeah, there's no way I could just like make a date with myself and that's the only time I'm gonna do it. You First know? of all, the I'm fact that you're setting once, a date with yourself right? to masturbate should know, be alarm kinda, bells that this is weird. It's kind of yeah. different, you know, but maybe it works for some people. I just haven't met anybody it worked for. And, and plus it's not congruent with Catholic teaching, right? right? So um, so they might have people like that. And uh, but But let's say you're Catholic and that's the only organization in your area. You just go there and you say, my bottom line is no masturbation, no pornography. And we have a rule that we tolerate everybody's bottom line in this group. And so it's okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. And Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous is, is really more for sex and love addiction. Um, there tend to be more women in that group. Um, and... And it, and it has more to do with like emotional attachments that people build. See, so. I, I, this Sexaholics Anonymous, that was the first one you spoke yeah. of. Do men and women go to that? They do. I would feel weird, I think, if I went to a group and there were women there. Yeah, you know, that's not everybody's experience. So like like sometimes like people might go and they feel really triggered by that person. But, but the stories I've heard are, are really more stories like um, they realize, you know, that what they were fantasizing about was actually this really broken person that now, now they're getting to know and now they see like mm. women as a pure person okay. instead of as an object you know so so it can be challenging sometimes there's women only meetings sometimes there's men only meetings um but it's really for anyone who struggles with compulsive sexual behavior and and they really the people i know that are involved in fellowships like that or alcoholics not, they're just really passionate about step 12 which means we carry the message to other people yeah. and and they want to provide a space for everybody. Isn't that beautiful? Because that's sort of what evangelization should be in a sense. Like exactly. you've encountered the healing the Lord has for you. You want other people to experience that healing as well. Right. Yeah. 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 And, and it's it's just a beautiful thing. And uh, and so, so yeah. So, so for me now, like I, I really refer a lot of people to 12 step and uh, and we have we have really strong community in in my city and and it's such a gift to have them there i suspect the number one fear is you know what if i see someone there i know to which you say uh to which i say well they know you too and now you get to know them better <laughs> yeah you know like now you can actually be friends and, and not have secrets from each other and <laughs> that's that's a good answer what other fears do people have before going to a 12-step group is it is it maybe a not wanting to admit that things have gotten this bad or downplaying their own yeah i behavior? think there's probably not wanting to admit it's this bad there's what if i see somebody i know what if other people find out i'm going there there's this weird thing that we have where we 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 sort of conflate sexual addiction and sexual offending which is a huge mistake mm -hmm. and and it's something that happens in the church a lot too because we we're so worried about like child abuse that that we don't sort of we, we sort of ignore you know like like people who just struggle to live chastity you know? right um and and so there can be a, a fear about that um sometimes it's a fear of quitting that we don't want to be honest about because my best friend for 10 years of my life who helped me through my parents divorce and helped me through this other difficult time helped me through when i lost my job i'm about to tell that friend i don't want to be your friend anymore and that's scary ah, just got the analogy right. right your best friend is the coping mechanism your best friend you is your addiction to deal yeah. with life yeah your okay. best friend's your addiction and that and that has to be grieved and people have to grieve the loss of their addiction and they won't they don't want to say like i don't want to grieve my addiction i hate my addiction well if you hated your addiction you wouldn't do it you know there's a part of you that's really attached to it yeah and and there's something it does for you that's right? very there's important There's something it does for you and so you have to fire it like okay you've been doing this job for me which is to make me feel affirmed when i feel rejected Okay, so I'm gonna fire you from that job, and now I'm gonna hire Jesus to do mm, that job. That's excellent, Father. You know, and and that's what twelve step groups help us do, and and it just gives us a community, and they're used to being a community, and and people call people every day, and and, and these are things too, like wow, wow, wow. I want you to make three phone calls every day to another guy in recovery, 
and uh, and that's the hardest thing for people to do because the phone weighs 500 pounds, but um, <laughs> but it's actually super it's super effective. And we and what we find out is like after a while, like I have friends, you know, people ask this question. They say they say like, how long do I have to go to this 12 step group thing, right? <laughs> People ask it about Al-Anon, if they're going to Al-Anon. They ask it about SA. They ask it about AA. Father, how long do you think I have to go to this group? <laughs> and, and the answer is you have to go. You have to go until you want to go. You're still asking that question. Go, okay. <laughs> right? Like you have to go until you want to go. And uh, and I remember talking. I have a great friend. He's a priest. And uh, and he he started calling me for accountability. And, and he was like, so, so like, how often do I have to call you? And I, and I said, look, dude, someday you're just gonna like want to call me, like like you're gonna be like, oh, I miss Sean, and I want to call him and just find out how his day was, and like yeah. it'll be great, and it'll be this thing that we talk about and read about in books called friendship, and, <laughs> and it'll be amazing, right? And and because that's really what we're doing, like recovery is just teaching somebody how to be a human again. That's all it is, and uh, and and it's it's just really. It brings a lot of joy to see people when when they start flourishing. I want to talk about what porn gives to us, what sexual sin gives to us, because I think the reason we're unwilling to admit that I get something from porn, that I enjoy watching porn, say, or whatever the sexual sin might be, is, I don't know, it feels like if, if I admit it, then maybe I'll admit it all the way and we'll decide, no, this is something I actually want to do, or it'll seem... I don't know, unholy if I'm admitting that there's something here that I enjoy about it. But of course, as you say, like sin is, a, it's a perceived good, which doesn't give us what it promises. But if it wasn't a perceived good, we wouldn't go for it. It's like the worm on the end of the hook for the fish. Mm -hmm. So talk to us about what we get from, let's just stick to pornography. Yeah. And in your discussions with people, maybe there's a myriad of it's things. So, so like pornography gives different people different things. Um, and so, so that's really the question. A really good resource for that is Jay Stringer's book, Unwanted, and where he, he talks about like different different kinds of pornography people might watch or, or like what's going on in your fantasy life reveals what you might desire, you know, what you might desire. So, so like, I mean, a just totally secular example away from pornography is I've been fascinated with the Detroit Lions rebuilding their football team this offseason. So I'm watching every interview with their head coach, their general manager, because they're changing their culture. It's a totally different thing, and people are excited to be there. And this is the D Detroit Lions, who I've been following since I was a kid, and they've always been horrible. And yeah. their front office has been a disaster. But this looks like it might work. And, and I'm just... I'm just obsessed with watching it because I think that I wish that the church as a whole would do the same kind of rebuild. You know, like we're going to change our culture and the way we operate and the way we communicate. And, and, and I think that's a, you know, that's a desire of my heart that then it gets like placed in this, you know, this thing I can watch. Um, people watch superhero shows because they want to be a superhero. And, um, and so some people watch pornography because they want to be affirmed. Mm -hmm. And so, so they might watch pornography that's about sort of like the nerd who gets pursued by the amazingly beautiful woman. Sometimes people watch pornography because they have a huge mother wound. And a lot of times we talk about father wounds, but there's also mother wounds. And, and so there's reason there's categories like, you know, stepmoms and all of that, my neighbor's mom, um, because, it, because it fills like a void and, and it answers a wound that a lot of people carry. You know, like why is step family porn like the most popular genre? Like how many people are growing up in blended families today? A ton. How many people don't feel close to their families today? A ton. And and so so it's it's like a desire that it's not necessarily a bad that there's a holy desire for communion and and then it sort of gets channeled into a fantasy through our sexuality because of what we get exposed to. And that might be the reason that we're attracted to that. Um, people use pornography to numb out. They might use it to numb out negative feelings. They might use it when they're bored. Um, okay, if you're bored and you look at pornography, then get a hobby and you should stop looking at pornography. Like, I don't know anybody who's told me, like, I started woodworking and it cured my pornography, right? Yeah. So, but, but if I'm bored, maybe, you know, maybe I have sadness that I just don't let myself tap into. I see. You know, like yeah. maybe I have grief that I just don't let myself tap and into. And it comes up when I'm, in act, and I just or not don't want to live my life, right? Like, I just don't want to live my life. Well, why don't I want to live my life? That's There's a question there. 
um, for a lot of people looking at pornography is like escaping into non-existence. You know, like I'm just not going to exist in this place. Like, like I just don't want to live my life. And uh, and and I think that's that's more common than we think. Um, so there can be all these reasons, and and that's. But each person has to figure out their own reason, and then we have to find the virtuous way of answering that desire. Right? The virtuous way of answering that desire. You know, like how do I let Mary have access to my heart? when I really have a problem trusting women, but the only women I can trust are the women in porn. You know, like it might take some work in spiritual direction, inner healing, you know, sometimes it's inner healing and spiritual direction and psychological work. Um, But how do I let Mary like have access to my heart? Mm. And how do I let St. Joseph be my new dad? You know, which is an amazing thing. And I'm so grateful for Father Calloway's book because I never thought about St. Joseph as my new dad after my father died. Like Mary's my new mom. That was kind of an easy, but St. Joseph's my new dad. And and then I look back on my life and I'm like, I was at St. Joseph's parish when my dad died. Hmm. Of course. And, but how do I let that happen? Um, like, how do I, how do I learn to like rely on people and depend on people and have real friendships? so that I don't have to have these fake relationships or fake friendships. Um, like that's the real work that happens in recovery. Um, like how do I let our Lord forgive my shame? Because sometimes we have shame and we look at porn to get rid of our shame feelings. And, and then looking at porn gives us more shame. And then we're in this huge cycle. Uh, but how do I like speak the truth into my shame? You know, And the, the path out of shame is vulnerability and, and experiencing the fact that somebody can know me completely and they still love me. And, and so again, for everybody, it's going to be a little bit different because we all have our own stories. We all have our own path into the woods where we got lost and, and, uh, and what we need is a guide, you know, to help us Mm -hmm. to interpret where we've been. I want to talk about fantasies a little bit more. Jay Stringer has this lovely line. He says, when you run from your shame, you legitimize its claims against you. And I've heard and multiple people speak about this, about um, being more curious and gentle with your fantasies rather than shaming. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you've spoken about it already, but I wonder if there's more to say there about, you know, why is it that this is the sort of porn I go to? Because there's a wide canopy, right, of different types of genres, and you're going for maybe to fill up some, some hole there, some need. Yeah, and and so we, like we do, we run away from the things we're ashamed of. We think we're the only one in the world who ever found that video, even (laughs) though it says a million people watched it. Um, And, but but there's there's always a lot of pain around that too, you know. And 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 sometimes we just don't want to face it. And but that means we don't want to face who we are. And it also means we're resistant to mercy, because mercy only comes in truth. You know, like mercy only comes when we are prepared to receive justice you know like mercy only comes when we're prepared to receive justice like the prodigal son who goes back to the father is prepared to receive justice excellent i'm not worth being called your son just make me a hired servant that's what i deserve okay you're ready to receive mercy and i'm going to put this robe on you and a ring on your finger and etc the woman caught in adultery is ready to be stoned doesn't say like she protested and said wait don't stone me and i didn't do it no like she's been exposed and everybody knows what she did and now everybody sees what she sees about herself and then her lord is able to bend down and write in the sand and look up look back up at her with his look of love and she's ready to receive mercy the christian equivalent then is what we have to be ready to accept hell or what is the punishment the justice i think that you would find that in a lot of the writings of the saints that i deserve hell because of my sins yeah but you have redeemed me Hmm. and and just to recognize that and it doesn't have to be a shameful thing it's just like yeah like what i've done like i deserve to go to hell for that and but our lord came into my life like he called me anyways and, and if we really realize that truth that he called me anyways, then our shame disappears. You know, in the beginning, the Lord goes and looks for Adam and he gives a half answer 
right? He tells a half truth, which we always do. We tell half truths, especially when we're addicts, we tell half truths. Mm. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself, right? Which is a lot different than saying, I ate the fruit, you told me not to eat, I ate it anyways, <laughs> you should smite me out of existence, I'm really afraid you're gonna do that, so I'm lying to you a little bit, you know? Um, it, I'm afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And then the Lord tells him what he did, because so that Adam will know that our Lord knows exactly what he did, and he's going to redeem him anyways. Mm. Samaritan woman at the well. You don't have a husband, you've had five. I know that about you. Mm. I'm still offering you living water. Because otherwise we're left in a place where our Lord's offering is love. Yeah, but if he really knew everything about me. Or how many men get married and their wife says to them on their wedding day, I take you as my husband. And in the back of their mind, they're saying, yeah, but if you knew that I looked at porn last week, you might not. That's a horrible place to be in. Mm. Because then he can't be received by her. Mm -hmm. And he's not going to feel received by her because of that lie or that lie of omission. And, and so... So like the answer to shame is vulnerability and in vulnerability, we receive our Lord's mercy and then we really receive it and we know that it's true, you know, and sometimes it takes a long time to, to recognize that that's true and, and our Lord continues to, and has continued, you know, I started therapy in 2012 when I was in grad school. And I just went on this retreat where our Lord just kind of like cleaned everything up like nine years later, 10 years later. And, uh, and it was amazing because I think it was the first time I kind of went through my history things and I was just like, yeah, you really do love me in those moments. Mm -hmm. don't you? you know, and before I was just like, eh, I don't really know about that. You know, it's like Jean Valjean in Les Mis, right? Who's caught stealing. And they take him back to the bishop. You know, we caught him. He stole your stuff. He says that you gave it to him. And, and John Valjean's like, I am toast. <laughs> and the bishop says, I did give it to him, but you forgot to take the best part. And he gives it to him and he says, you know, I'm buying your soul for God. I'm ransoming you for God. And, and there's this experience of a super mercy that happens that moves him to a life of service and sacrifice mm -hmm. and to do for others as has been done for him. And, and that's like, that's what happens that launches us in recovery, right? Like that's what happens when we give up our addiction. That's what happens when we start telling the truth about ourselves is, is then we, we have this experience of this super mercy. You know, one of my favorite essay lines is, is I'm grateful to the one who kept me sober today and kept me from the full consequences of my behavior in the past. <laughs> That's a beautiful line, you know, which really means our Lord has given us all a super mercy. You know, like how many of us have done things in our life that we're so happy nobody knew about. Mm -hmm. um, and our Lord has done that, but we don't always give him the glory for doing that. And, and that's what we learn in recovery, you know? Like that's, that's like what's on the other end of quitting my porn addiction. What's different about this discussion to the discussions I think many of us were having in the church 10 plus years ago is that 10 plus years ago, there are a lot of tips and tricks, which mm -hmm. actually initially are a lot, I'm a lot more open to hearing, right? Mm -hmm. We heard things like put your monitor into a high traffic area right. and get right. covenant eyes and um, you know, have an accountability partner and make sure you do this. And, uh, and not to say that those aren't great pieces of advice, but it's a lot easier to hear tips and tricks than to hear you need to go through your own healing journey. Like that's like, oh no, anything but that. No, I agree. And like, but I think what happened was we started doing tips and tricks. And then for a certain group of people that work, and then for this other group of people that don't work. Exactly. And it's not fair to leave that group of people that they don't work hanging. I would say the majority of people, wouldn't you? I would say today the majority of people, those things don't work. And when we just learned, and, and that's kind of my, my perspective is I'll endorse anything if somebody can tell me that they're healed and they're sober for more than a year. Hmm. Um, I'll endorse anything. So, so if you've got a program you've done and you're healed from 
more than a year and you're willing to tell me your story, like I will go, I will go all over the country, wherever I go, and I'll say, yeah, this one program I heard is really effective and it worked. Um, but that's just kind of where I'm at. Like, I, like I'm not going to validate something unless I, like I know it works. And, and so often what we've done in the past is we talk about the things we hope will work, but we're not sure yes. they will. Yes. You know, like I hope this will work. And but I don't really know if it's going to work because nobody's ever consistently talked to me to know whether or not that was helpful for them. You know, I was talking to a priest earlier today and he had a, a parishioner that did a certain online program. And and I was like, yeah, did it work? And he said, I don't know. They never talked to me again. Oh. OK, so like we don't know if it worked. And um, is not part of the problem, though, that it works for some and not for others? And so depending I think on who that's, you talk I think to. that's part of the problem. I've just, there's certain things that I've never heard anybody with that story. Yeah. You know, and. Uh, like what you just said earlier, like boredom. I took up woodwork. <laughs> exactly. So that right. must, yeah. Right, exactly. Because otherwise there would be, you know, like a ton of people. <laughs> and, and like sometimes like people do get healed through deliverance ministry. And, and I think that's, and I think that's true. And, and a lot of times, like when I've talked to people who do deliverance ministry, and have written books on deliverance ministry, they might say, yeah, like like what I've seen is when, when people have already done a lot of other things and then they do this, like this kind of like comes in at the end and cleans everything up. And, and I believe that's true. Um, and I believe that's, that that's a real story. Um, but, but like if there was a certain priest who had a charism for just saying a prayer over you and then you quit, like that guy should have a line like five miles long outside his rectory right now. You know, because everybody would be telling everybody mm -hmm. that this worked, <laughs> you know, because that's what we do. Yeah. And um, back in the day when I started the Porn Effect, which is a website I used to run, um, I, I remember being kind of scolded by this one guy who said that you should not be promoting the 12 steps. What you need to be doing is telling people to get on their bloody knees in the confessional and to confess and repent. That's mm -hmm. what they need to do. And I'm like, I'm not saying they don't need to do that. So I hope they would do that. But what, what's your response to that sort of? My response to that is that I have, like, people are already doing that. Like, they're already doing that. And so, like, like thanks for educating me about, like, the most basic, normal thing that anybody has ever tried to do to stop looking at pornography. Thanks. I didn't realize that you could go to confession. Sorry for being, like... But yeah. that is just angers me because it's it's like a deflective response and it's kind of a shaming response. It is a shaming response because and because the conclusion is if you have been doing that and you're not healed, that's clearly because you're not opening yourself up to the grace God wants to give you in the confessional. So right. just do that again harder. Right. And they might not be open to the grace that God wants to give them because they're not being honest, but because they need to learn how to be honest. But we need to learn how to be honest. And, yeah. and there's a process for learning how to be honest. Like, like, like most Christians who struggle with porn addiction, they, they misdiagnose where they're at in the spiritual life. How so? What do they do? Okay, first stage of the spiritual life, according to John of the Cross, is? Uh, the uh, the uh, purgative? The purgative way was the beginning step of the purgative way. Uh, the fear? That's like initial re repentance, right? Like, I'm a sinner okay. who needs mercy. Like, that's the first thing that happens, right? Yeah. And so if somebody's an addict, they're a sinner who needs mercy. Yeah. They're not in the dark night of the soul. They're not like, they're not like this far along. And, and of course, like spiritual writers say, like you can experience things in all yes. three areas at the same time. But like the main thing is I have sin in my life and I need to get rid of the sin in my life. Right. And so, so like I need to pray as if I'm a sinner who needs to surrender my life to God. I don't need to pray as if I'm a mystic who just has a porn problem on the side every three weeks. Ooh, okay, yeah. If you want to be free, right? If you want to be free. And and so so there's this kind of like, that's why I call it a misdiagnosis of where I am in the stages of the spiritual life. Because I can have a really high-powered devotional life, but not really talk to our Lord. Mm, right? I've experienced that lately. I, I noticed this last week, I've been really faithful to praying the rosary every night with mm -hmm. the kids. And I've been proud of myself for getting that done. And I think that's objectively a good thing to do. It is. Yeah. And then just today as I was driving, I asked myself, when's the last time I prayed? And it's probably been about a week. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I should be praying daily, but I've been praying the rosary every day. Okay, but obviously I haven't really been praying during that rosary. Right. Like during that rosary, I've been like, sit down, 
All right, now it's, I want you to say the next decade. You know, it's it's more of a how do we, you know, get this culture of prayer going in our family, which is something mm-hmm. that's admirable. But as you say, you can you can use the rosary or e- any devotion to deflect intimacy with Jesus. He you wants can. to speak to you. Yeah. I pick up the beads. That's something I can complete and not have to engage with our right. Lord. In. And, and so in, I've been listening to Fulfillment of All Desire by Ralph Martin, which Love is him. an incredible book. And, yeah. and uh, just the compendium of wisdom. And and people like, you know, Catherine of Siena and Teresa of Avila and the Little Flower and John of the Cross. Like they talk about that and how... You know, it's more efficacious to like share hearts with our Lord than to have this high-powered devotional life. And but sharing hearts with our Lord is uh, that's kind of like intimate and vulnerable, and you know, I and really often just rather if we've got a skewed out. idea of what prayer is, it doesn't even necessarily feel like prayer. Right? Yeah. Prayer is the devotional thing. So if you're telling me to do some psychological sappy right. thing with our Lord. Okay, that's a yeah. bit weird, but uh, and a bit limp-wristed. But I don't think this is prayer exactly. This is but, the kind of this is what people say. They're saying limp-wristed. They, I'm not. Level. I'm not using that language. I'm yeah. hearing people say that to me. Yeah, and so I would just refer them to the spiritual writers that <laughs> talk about it. How like that is a higher level of prayer, yeah. and and like that should be the goal. And you know, and even you know, I, I saw a talk by uh, I forget who it was. It was on the last uh, virtual Catholic conference that Chastity Project did. Um, mm-hmm. It was a guy. It was a guy. He sees with Exodus ninety, and and what he was really promoting was like twenty minutes of conversation with our Lord a day, mm. right? And and that's what he was really promoting was not um, having your list, not having like all, but just twenty minutes of vulnerable conversation with him, and um, and it was a good reminder for me too because like I just I went on. The part of my last retreat was like, you know, in high school, I used to talk to you just like you were my friend. And mm. uh, I haven't been doing that lately. And I'd really love to get back to that again. Amen. And Do you so. see what we've just done here? This has been really interesting. Just about 10, 15 minutes ago, we spoke about how we want to hear tips. We don't really want to hear, hear about like the deep healing process, the trauma recovery. And now we're doing something similar here where I want to hear devotions mm-hmm. i don't want to hear conversation and intimacy with our lord it's the same yeah. kind of thing isn't it, it is yeah it's interesting hmm. it's more interesting i mean it's more interesting to talk about the deeper things than the I agree. than the tips but and it is interesting that we're getting there like we want we need to hear this because we've been doing the tip thing mm-hmm. here's the five ways to overcome pornography and that can be helpful when writing a book or giving a talk or wanting mm-hmm. to outline something for people to remember yeah but it yeah. has to be tied into that it does because it's about transformation of the heart. Like it, it, it's just about transformation of the heart. It's like anything you have to do to give your heart to our Lord. That's it. That's all it is. Like there's one thing you have to do to be free from pornography is give your heart to our Lord. That's it. So why does How it, you why do that it is like simple, that's yeah. it, it's really super simple, but it's really hard, right? Like all things in the spiritual life, and so so there are these tools to help us to do that but that's the goal right that's the goal you know the goal is not to quit (laughs) masturbating the goal is to give your heart entirely to our lord and to let him transform you so that your attitudes are different so that you're you don't carry around resentment that your boss doesn't appreciate you because you know that our lord delights in you Mm. and so that the small things don't don't bother you so you don't transfer your addiction from pornography to like a bowl of M&Ms that you keep in your kitchen all the time and you graze on like as you pass by and you're pissed off at somebody. Like, not that I've ever done that. <laughs> it's very specific. You know, not that I've ever done that. <laughs> like a bowl of M&Ms with Dove chocolates over here, right? Like, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, yeah I, I just discovered like how much I use food to regulate my emotions because I went on this like crazy mm-hmm. diet and uh, and it has like grounded me in a way that I haven't been in so long and, and my prayer life is better than it's ever been. and. So, so I, I'm realizing that I had, I would never like go to an OA meeting, but I like I had an addictive relationship what with is an food OA in a meeting? way. Overeaters Anonymous. Okay. Yeah. There's, there's, there's meetings for everybody. <laughs> yeah. You know? What's your problem? We got something for you. I know. And you, like, I just want to put outside my church, like That's Sinners that. Anonymous meets at 11 a.m. on Sundays <laughs> and you're all welcome, right? You're all welcome. <laughs> yeah. So. Hmm. One thing I think we used to say that I hope we're beginning to st- stop saying is uh, if you've looked at pornography, like don't tell your wife. 
you don't need to tell your wife. Mm -hmm. Uh, This is between you and the Lord, and this is something you just have to get a confession about. Uh, But feel free to talk into that. No, I think that, uh, I think that, you know, I remember being a seminarian in moral theology class and learning that, right? Like, like, because there's a, there's a sort of principle that, you know, you don't want to cause her more harm, right? You don't want to cause her more harm. And, and uh, it's kind of like step nine in the 12 steps where like I make amends where when to do so would not cause undue harm. And, and so then the question really becomes like, mm. like who deserves that information, right? Who deserves that information? And, and I might ask a question like, like what if you lied to your wife about the fact that you had the flu last week, right? And you might've given her the flu. Like, should you make restitution for that? Mm-hmm. Should you, you say should. I'm sorry for that? Yes, you should. Right. Yeah, because you don't want to carry around lies. Is it okay to lie to your wife? Like no. when you said I promise to be true to you in good times and in bad, doesn't that include telling the truth? And, and so really the question then becomes like for a married couple is how many times have you lied to your wife about your sexual behaviors? I want to just challenge you a little there because I think there is a distinct difference between telling a falsehood and withholding something. Like there, there is a difference there. One is a lie and one isn't. Okay, one is an omission. <clears throat> Can you lie by omission? Well, give me an example. I mean, if you ask me a question and I deflect, then yes, you can do that. Should you in a marital relationship might be the question. Deflect? Yeah, and I think the answer is no, but yeah, I'm just saying, no. but, but yeah. by omission, are you saying, what, what do you mean by omission? Well, I don't know. Like, let's say that you get married, but you don't disclose to your wife that you're impotent. Right, that's something she has a right to know. That's something she has a right to yeah. know. Yeah. What if you don't disclose to your wife that you have a massive addiction yeah, she has a right to know that. You Absolutely. don't disclose to your wife your like history of mental illness. Yeah, I think it's a matter of justice. Yeah, she. Yeah, so the, yeah. so it's expected that you would disclose that information. Yeah. So not disclosing it is to lie, yeah, because I you're leading know. her to believe. Uh, I'm we can pull out the catechism but, and look up all the ways you can lie. There's lots of them. Okay, um, but maybe we need a different word for it because I th- <clears throat> I think like suppose um, a husband goes to his wife's mother's funeral and it's the last kind of uh family member Mm -hmm. and she's distraught and that weekend this man looks upon and masturbates he might say i'm not going to say anything to her right now because this is just going to cause her undue harm so i'm going to wait a few weeks or something like that he might say that right Right. so there could be a a matter of omission that's taking place there even if she were his intention is to eventually tell the truth yeah yeah best policy is always to tell the truth yeah i agree also because you'll stay an addict if you don't tell the truth Yeah. yeah Because addicts lie, and the only way out is like to be absolutely honest. That's a that's a great point, and I'm agreeing with you. Like I right. began this conversation by saying men should tell their wives, right? Mm-hmm. Just to be clear. Right. So, um, <clears throat> so, so yes, like men should tell their wives. Yeah. Men should also get help when they tell their wife. What does that mean? It means that, like, <clears throat> so, so I, I think the ideal path is this. Like, let's say there's a man who's struggling with porn and he gets help. He wants to get help. He might go to his priest, they might like start talking. Maybe he figures out he needs a therapist, he starts going to therapy. If he goes to see a sex addiction therapist who's trained in doing things like disclosures, that sex addiction therapist is gonna make sure that he knows everything about his story before he tells his wife everything. Mm -hmm. Because what we want to avoid are trickle disclosures. Mm. A trickle disclosure is, yeah, I went to see father because I, I've got this problem with porn with porn and masturbation. Okay, so like you've never had an affair. Nope, nope, no, 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 no. And then like three weeks later, four weeks later in therapy, there's more clarity and more memory. Oh yeah. Also, I made out with that girl at this place. Yep. And then he goes back and tells his wife, there's something I forgot to tell you. Mm-hmm. So he's just re And then oh away. yeah. There's something I forgot, right? And so that puts a woman in a position where she gets like traumatized yeah. again and again and again and again. And she says questions, is this everything? Yeah, yes, it's everything. No, it, it wasn't everything. Yeah. And so because the ultimate goal is going to be like you violated trust. The goal now is to like move you both to reestablishing trust. And and you do you do that by being honest every day. And so, so there are therapists who are trained in this process and, and the process typically is going to look like, um, he's going to therapy, he's working on knowing his whole story. 
he does a soft disclosure with his wife. A soft disclosure is something like, okay, I've been going to therapy and, and, and really like I have had an addiction for a very long time and I want to tell you everything, but I really want to do it in my therapist office. And I want to make sure that, that you have somebody there for you. And, and the wife might start going to therapy too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then the wife gets a therapist. This is ideal, right? And then, and then the two therapists have a permission to talk to each other. He writes his disclosure. The wife writes all her questions about what mm. she has. The therapist compare notes. If there's something she has questions about that aren't in his disclosure, he adds it to his disclosure. Um, if there's something, you know, and, and so they just make sure it try to make it as safe mm -hmm, as possible. Mm -hmm. And then there's two different methods that might be used. Like one is where they both meet in the office and he just reads it to her. The other one is called like Bree's way. Um, because I think the person who invented it, her name was Bree. And, and this is also, uh, it's a technique also for like women who confront an abuser. And so, so it would be like the woman's in her therapist office. The guy knocks on the door. She's allowed in the office. Right. She gives him permission to come in because it gives her more safety. And then he does the disclosure. And at any point, she can tell him, you need to get out. And then he might leave and she composes herself and then she invites him back in. Right. Mm. So it just provides a little more safety. It just depends on where the couple is right now. And uh, and then she has an opportunity to respond. And, and so so it just helps things to be more safe and contained. You know, Kevin yep. Skinner's done a ton of research on this. And, and I, I do think it's like in the 90th percentile of couples who are glad that they did that yeah, process. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, all of this might sound very overwhelming to someone watching right now with a porn addiction. I mean, just telling them to go to therapy is overwhelming enough. And now it sounds like you're telling the wife to go to therapy and to disclose this stuff within a therapist's office. And I can imagine someone be like, okay, I'm just not going to think about it anymore because this is, this, this is too much. Even just practically, how am I going to find these kind of therapists? Mm -hmm. Is this something that everyone should be doing? This kind of, I mean, you said this is the ideal way. Yeah, that's the ideal way for a couple with a really bad addiction. And so, so I always say there's like funnel of care, right? And funnel of care means lowest invasive thing to most invasive thing, um, where we can handle the most people, the least people, like just go to confession. And if you can quit just going to confession, awesome, right? Now for me, like I'm free means I'm free for a year. Right. Anything short of that is like, OK, I'm, I'm doing a good job white knuckling or, mm -hmm. you know, but I'm free means I'm free for a year. Also, the church has always used one year of continence as the standard for discerning whether somebody can live celibacy for the rest of their life. So I'm free means I'm free for a year. And uh, and so so confession, then I'm going to use like filters and see if that just like with filters, I'm good. Um, nope, not good. Spiritual direction, and I'm gonna like work on my prayer life, and maybe there's some spiritual healing, inner healing, and uh, I'm still acting out. Um, going to 12 step group, getting a therapist, going on a therapy intensive, which is a three day workshop. Like in Kansas City, we do the My House workshop yeah. for men. Um, going to inpatient treatment is way down here. And, and it all depends on like how escalated somebody is, how bad it is, how much have you done, what are your wife's expectations. Like if somebody's wife has a history of betrayal in her history, mm -hmm. it's going to cause a lot more pain than if she doesn't. What kind of support? So there's a lot of discernment that has to happen, right, right. and they need to find someone to help them discern. But the last thing that I want for anybody is to just stay living a double life. Yeah, you know, to just stay in the darkness because the light is really good. <laughs> the light is really good. And, and I just don't want anybody to like stay in the darkness. And I also don't want people to be, um, kind of let down or disappointed because they feel like they've done the advice they've been given and it didn't work. Yeah. That's you know? exhausting. Cause a lot of people like fall into despair because they've been given a limited amount of advice and it didn't work. You know, I prayed every novena in the book and none of them worked. I'm wearing right. literally every colored <laughs> scapula. <laughs> right. But I didn't know that there were all these other things. Mm. I didn't know there were all these other things. What um, What is unhelpful to disclose to one's spouse? I mean, Details are unhelpful to disclose. Okay, so how would a husband or a wife say to their spouse when they question them, which I think is a natural follow-up to yeah. someone saying they fell. They say, well, what were you looking at? Where so were you looking again, at? What did you type in? The ideal is this. They do it with a therapist. And then the wife has a therapist, and the wife listens to her therapist when the therapist tells her, mm -hmm. you don't want to know see. that. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know enough. You don't need to know. 
that he had fetish plate wearing giraffe heads because you'll never be able to go to the zoo again. That is not the first time right? you've said that. Like, you'll line, never, surely. That you'll, was excellent. You'll never know. You, you'll never be able to go to the zoo again, <laughs> right? So, so there are certain things that could trigger and poison yeah. other experiences, yes, and, yes. and and so you don't need to know details. Like, like would you need to know number of affair partners? Yes. Yeah. Okay, you, but okay, keep going. Keep going. Do you need to know if it's the neighbor that you know? Yes. Do you need to know if somebody you're going to run into? Yes. Do you need to know it was hotel room number five 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 six seven at that hotel and in, in this place and and wearing red shoes? No, because those numbers, the shoes, the place, yeah. the street, all of it'll be poison. And and so there's a reason not to disclose like all those kinds of details. Mm-hmm. Um, and and it happens, you know. And there's a, there's like sad stories because what happens is then like, when the women start googling everything that you know their husband googles and. And there's all kinds of questions, and the and the more education that we have, we realize that sex addiction is not about sex, like it's about other things. Mm-hmm. And but then in betrayal, Absolutely. we can feel like it's about me, and I don't satisfy as much as this, Absolutely. you know. And and sex addiction is about I'm not okay with God more than it's like I'm not okay with my wife. Yeah, yeah. I can't be 100%. alone. I can't be alone with God. And, and so, so it really, that's why like more education is, is helpful. Like for women bloom for Catholic women has been a great resource and website, um, because it just helps them to see and bloom for bl- bl- just so people are aware, bloom, bloom like the flower, for, bloom like the flower, F O R Catholic And, uh, it's been a, just a great resource for them in terms of like understanding what's going on with them. You know, one wife recently said to me, like, like I went there and they were telling me what I was experiencing wow. and that's what I needed. Yeah. Like I need to know I'm not a crazy person and that what I'm experiencing is normal. And, and I think we all need that. Like we all need to know what we're experiencing is normal. You know, it's like no surprise that I had a porn addiction at one point in my life. Like, like given my family background, my family history, the way I grew up, the kind of exposures I had, the environment when I was in college, like of course I ended up being mm-hmm. a porn addict. Yeah, and 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 that's okay to say that. Yes, and the other thing is like, of course our wanted our Lord wanted to redeem me, and and our Lord can redeem me in truth, right? In truth, which means I can go to Him and say, I did all of these things, and He says, I love you anyways. Talk about freedom as a destination we reach and a journey that we take. I think sometimes we think of freedom usually in the first sense. This guy needs to pray over me, then I'll be free. Pray a rosary every day, then I'll be free. Yeah. Well, like freedom comes, like freedom is the freedom of the children of God, right? Like freedom is the freedom of the children of God. And when we talk about freedom, generally speaking, right? Like we're free to make choices. And we're free to choose between two good things, right? That's why. Like, we never really are asked to choose between a good thing and a bad thing, mm-hmm. you know, because we're meant to reject the bad thing mm-hmm. and always mm-hmm. choose the good thing. But we're, we can choose between two good things. And and uh, and so when we're in addiction or when we're in slavery, when we're enslaved to sin, whatever the sin is, we're not free anymore. And, and then we're not free to choose between two good things. We're not free to choose even between the good and the bad. Sometimes we're enslaved to the bad. And, and so when we talk about freedom from lust, right, it really means I need to be free to be loved by our Lord. That's what we should be focused on. Mm. You know, like I need to be free to be loved by our Lord. And there's nothing in me that says, yeah, but he shouldn't love me, you know, or yeah, but I want to be independent, right? Cause, cause we're never looking for independence in our freedom as Christians, Right, it's always freedom to be in relationship with God. Mm-hmm. It's the freedom that comes from being a beloved son or a beloved daughter. It's not freedom outside of that. And and so so that's the journey of the heart that every one of us takes is is like to be more and more free to be loved by Him. You know, to me, every relapse just means there's a part of me that doesn't want to be loved by our Lord. Like, what is that about? Mm-hmm. You know, like why didn't I go to our Lord? Why isn't our Lord my refuge? Mm-hmm. And and so so that's the freedom that we're trying to have, and and it is a journey, right? It is a journey. Now, ideally, like we we are going to always reject things that are intrinsically evil, right? 
and and Stefan Kampowski gave this talk on this and, and I just like loved it because he was talking about like martyrdom and like the moral law and how like there are certain things in life where we just say I can't do that. Mm-hmm. You know, and there are certain th- and we have total freedom to say, I can't do that. You know, and and so for instance, like like I did say this to a kid last night at, at the Steubenville conference. I said, you know, like there are certain things in your life where you say, I just can't do that. You know, like what if I told you to go home, wait till your mom falls asleep and smother her to death? <laughs> what would you say? Yeah, like, no, you're I, crazy. Yeah. I can't do that. Like you can't do it. There's nothing in you that could do that. This is the you, weirdest penance I've ever cause, received. Cause you love your mom and she loves you. So you yeah. can't do that. So you need to have looking at porn become an I can't do that hmm. in the same way. But somewhere along the line, I don't know why, like looking at porn became okay, what are all the circumstances of my life that could reduce my culpability so that I'm not really responsible and I could get away with it? Where did that happen? You know, like, did we learn too much moral theology along the way? <laughs> you know, if you're doing moral theology in your head during your ritual, you're probably free <laughs> enough to say no. And and so, so, but it's not an I can't do that. And, and we need to get to an I can't do that. Yeah. And then the journey of freedom is like, it's really about, okay, I definitely can't look at porn or masturbate because it's intrinsically, it's an intrinsically evil act. Like the catechism says in the history of the church, it has always been mm-hmm. believed to be intrinsically and gravely disordered, right? We never really talk about that with regard to masturbation, which we should. And, um, and so, so if it's intrinsically disordered, I need it, that needs to be an I can't do that. But then there's like, meh that kind of impure fantasy that comes into our head when we're going to sleep at night and that nostalgia for the one girl I never made out with in high school, but I wish I would have. And, and you know, like when we have nostalgia for the sins we never committed or like lost yeah. regrets, Flesh pots of those things need to become, I can't do that. Mm-hmm. You know, and, yeah. and for some people like YouTube needs to become, and I can't do that unless you're watching Pints with Aquinas. <laughs> Even then, I, I think it'd be better for you if you stopped <laughs> right? watching all YouTube. Or for some people, Facebook needs to be, and I can't do that. Yeah. You know, and and so like our journey of initial sobriety is about identifying what are the I can't do that's, because it's gonna lead me down this road. Yeah. And and really, if we really want to be vigilant, every time we relapse, we're like, okay, what I do? Yep, can't do that anymore. Mm-hmm. What are some examples from your own kind of counseling people? specific examples of I can't do that that they've come to on their own that might shock some people perhaps so so like in the three circles right the three circles of the inner circle is then I can't do that right mm-hmm. the yellow circle is if I do this I'm probably going to end up in the red and then like the green circle is positive things I need to do for my life and right. and so kind of some yellow circle things would be like watching rated R movies just can't do that anymore um some other things are what I've said like social media Mm -hmm. being on Facebook I knew somebody who was always free when they did Exodus 90 and and his therapist said you need to always be in Exodus 90 (laughs) you You need to do Exodus 95 million okay (laughs) no but but the thing is like what I knew was that he also was free the entire Lent he gave up television so really it was giving up television and he can leave the rest Mm -hmm. but he needs to keep giving up television alcohol is probably another one alcohol can be another one right sometimes people realize i can't be sober unless i quit drinking um some people it's food sexually too. sober just to be clear sexually sober <laughs> Sex, i can't be sexually sober unless i quit yeah. drinking other uh, also like if um also food can be a thing right like i can't eat mcdonald's for lunch you know there's yeah. a there's a great exercise called the personal craziness index and it kind of has this list of things and if i get so many points because i'm doing these things i'm probably going to relapse Right, like if I didn't pray my prayers at the right time of the day, if my room's a mess, if I my, ran out of gas, you know, like there's all these different areas of our life, yeah. and, and it's a really great tool for it's predicting excellent. when you're vulnerable. What what kind of tool is this? Uh, it's in the Facing the Shadows book by okay. Patrick Carnes. Oh, yeah. So it's called the Personal Craziness Index, and, I like and basically that. there's ten areas of life. You identify three things in that area that mean that area of your life's out of order. Right, so personal space. Didn't make my bed, laundry on the floor, and I didn't water my plants. Or get, or like Relational. transportation. It, I my gas light comes on. I'm overdue for an oil change, and the back seat of my car looks like a trash can. Um, and then there's like personal health. There's relationships. Like there's mm-hmm. hobbies. Like what am I neglecting to do when I'm 
unmanageable. Like, what if I really love um, painting or something, but I don't paint, I haven't painted in like months because I'm over busy and, and you know, so I'm not doing things that are good for me. And, uh, and so you make a list of 30 things, you will whittle it down to the top seven things, and then every day you do an inventory. And, and so then at the end of That's the week, really you add up your inventory and then there's a scale. Like if I'm between 10 and 20, I'm still doing okay. If I'm over 30, I'm probably going to relapse. Like that's how it works. Um, and so those are kind of like yellow circle things they are kind of yeah. like, I can't do that. It's like, I definitely can't have all those things going on at the same time. Um, so just so I'm clear on this sobriety plan or this three circle uh-huh. thing, you can put things in the yellow section, the middle section, which uh, so rather, you could put things that could be in the yellow section in the red section. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So it's not like this is objectively. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not. When I put it in the middle section, I'm saying no. I'm not necessarily saying this is objectively wrong. I'm saying I cannot do this thing. That exactly. Gotcha. Right. So, so one of the challenge questions is, what are you willing to put in the center circle? Oh, that's a very challenging question. Right. Because sometimes you got to put alcohol in the center circle. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you got to put social media, YouTube, whatever in the center circle. So the center circle, I used to call it the mortal sin circle, the occasion of sin circle, yeah. but just to make an analogy, but really it's the, like, this is what I'm saying I cannot do anymore because I can't do it in moderation. Yep. Yep. You no, know, like I can't go to YouTube in moderation. I can't play Monopoly on my phone in moderation. So I say, I'm going to play for one game. I play three games. Um, like there's certain things that we just discover we can't do in moderation unless we have more structure in our life and the purpose of the structure is to build a virtue and it's almost like we go to porn to impose a false sense of structure or false sense of security on our lives because it is often when we're in a chaotic state that we seek Mm -hmm. that thing as if it were the pacifier that will soothe me yeah i think so i think probably different people experience it in different ways i think sometimes people experience it like like everything's chaos and i can't handle the chaos and i'm just gonna like not exist I, yeah you said that earlier you know, I'm just and i wanted to explain exist what anymore. that means because it's uh i just mean like like is it dissociating is that what it that is means? dissociating and what yeah. do we mean by that it means that like how many people and you could ask I'm, I'm not going to ask everybody to write in the chat but like have ever started looking at porn and three hours went by and you didn't notice like just didn't notice the time went by um and you go into this fantasy world where nothing is real Hmm. and and i think it's emmanuel munier in personalism where he talks about this kind of like depersonalization as a way of moving into non-existence like i'm just not doing life today yeah wow just not doing life today you know, like how many times people like in a kind of funk or depression, they, they don't answer their texts. They don't answer their phone. They hit the well, ignore button that, even though I'm nothing's proud of going on. Mm. Um, and it's not that for the sake of being free. It's just sure. like they don't want to get out of bed. It reminds me of those stupid shirts. I'm not adulting. Can't adult today. Yeah, like that. <laughs> right. That's kind of what I mean by yeah. like moving into non-existing. And or people who watch VR porn and just get lost in it all day. Um, mm. there's all kinds of, of ways of, of like not wanting to be and it, or, or people who have like such an extreme double life where they, they kind of go into a fugue state when they go to bath houses or something like that. I mean, these are more escalated things that happen. To what, what does a fugue state mean? Fugue state is like when you go into a total dissociative state, but you're like functioning and you're driving your car and you're going places, but you don't actually remember anything that happened. It's like a blackout period. Wow. Wow. And people's personality might be a little different. In that. That's kind of like in Breaking Bad, is it? Where Walter White strips down and walks into that supermarket and pretends he blacked out? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Did you ever watch that? I have watched it a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, I don't too. remember. <laughs> it's a fascinating journey of yeah. like the spiral degradation downward. of a person. It's kind of sad that a lot of our movies are like that today. And we just clap and applaud them for being so realistic. I mean, there is something to be said about seeing how a man lies to himself and ends up in hell. Right. Yeah, I used to enjoy, um, I don't know, I used to enjoy things that were more realistic. Like I remember growing up in the 80s and everything was like magical and happy. And then the 90s came and like grunge music came and I was like, wow, these people are singing about my real life. And I kind of liked that. But then we just get like, there's no hope, you know, like there's no like, (laughs) there's no focus on a future maybe. And, and I don't know, I just can think about my own life and times when I've been stuck in my present or stuck in my past. And it was like, where am I going? 
Mm-hmm. You know, and and it's only like when we're again going back to the freedom to be in relationship with our Lord, the freedom of being a son, it opens up this horizon of the future, and and our Lord came to make all things new, and uh, and and really, like the joy in my own life right now is that every day I'm kind of like, what new thing is Jesus going to do today? Mm-hmm. And uh, and I kind of get up excited to go pray and find out what the new thing is, is that He wants to place on my heart today and. There's something really exciting about that. Mm-hmm. And and that's like the joy that I want for everybody in recovery is is that they start thinking about that and not thinking about like, how can I keep from acting out today? Yeah. Right? Yeah. In the initial stages, that's what we do. But but the purpose is to get to there, to get mm-hmm. to this like mm-hmm. place where like I have a future and, and my future opens up for me and, and I'm grounded and and life is beautiful. You know, I was talking to I was talking to somebody recently. <clears throat> this guy called me like his therapist put him in touch with me maybe like two years ago. And, and I, I remember I was on my way to visit a friend in Oklahoma and I, he called me on the phone and we talked for a while and then he started going to group and, and, uh, and he kind of went through these phases in group where he, he would like come to the meeting and zoom, but he wouldn't like turn his camera on. Okay. And then, and then like months later he turned his camera on and then he decided to go to face to face meetings in his own town. And then we didn't see him. Well, this guy, like he, um, I, t- I called him. He's been free for like a year and a half and he sounded like a completely really? different guy. He was like super grounded. Life is good. And, uh, and I was just, I was just filled with joy, you know, that, that somewhere in his journey, um, our lives intersected and, and just to see the difference in him and, and that's how he's living now, you know, and he's talking to me and he's, he's got these goals and things that he's working on and, and and he's just like free and he doesn't spend all his time thinking about this thing that that he hates here's a question for you because you you talked about people kind of not really understanding where they are on the spiritual life they think they're a mystic who has this side born Mm. problem and really they're just in the repentance stage but suppose your friend had been free a year and a half i think you said Mm -hmm. um then has too much to drink one night and makes a stupid decision where is he is he still free is he still is there a difference between a relapse and then just sort of spiraling or? I, I think he like, he drinks too much that night. He commits sin. Then he goes to confession and then he's like back on the set. I think that's, you know, he's probably in a different place. He's probably not like in the beginning stage. Yeah. Um, I think for the person who's weakly acting out, there's not much argument that they're not in the beginning stage. No, I, I think yeah, for the person who's right. never actually let our Lord you know, like brought, come to our Lord asking in earnest for his mercy and received it is probably not in that stage. And sometimes it's hard to do that, you know, and these, again, these are things that people should talk to their own spiritual director about and discern. But, but I know in my own life and in the lives of many people that, that they hadn't actually done that very well. Mm. You know, they hadn't actually done that very well because in the beginning stages, when we want to get help, we don't tell everything. I'm going to give you, I remember going to therapy the first time and I was like, I'm going to tell my therapist just enough information so she can give me just enough feedback (laughs) that I can fix myself without telling her everything about myself. (laughs) Right. It doesn't work. Don't do that. It doesn't work. Mm. You know, I um, think you'd agree with this that like another thing that's changed over the last 10 or so years since we've been talking about this is that obviously women look at porn. And right. I, I, I just parroted what I had heard said when I started doing this 12 years ago. Mm-hmm. I would say things like, well, women can be into romance novels, and yeah. which there's truth to that. I don't know how many men went out and bought Fifty Shades of Stupid or who would want a kind of <clears throat> equivalent for men. So mm-hmm. there's a truth there. But I just kept encountering these lovely women who were like, yeah, I look at porn and I feel so alone and so ashamed. Um, but then on the, on the flip side, I would say that I don't meet a lot of men who are like, my wife's addicted to porn. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if if you're seeing that as well. Like I'm meeting single girls who are hooked on porn. I'm sure married women are looking at porn sure. as well, but that seems to be the minority, at yeah, least compared I, to the men. I think, that, I think that there's like, I've talked about the ladder of shame, you know, which yeah. is kind of like Talk single man, yeah. single man, single woman. And then there's married man, married woman. 
And then you get into religious life and you've got like deacon, pre, a seminarian, deacon, priest, bishop, religious sister, right? Like this is kind of like a ladder of shame, like the people who shouldn't look at porn. And then once you do, and then the closer you get to order, like all of that. Mm. And the focused missionaries fall somewhere high in there. Mm. You know, like if you work for the church and you are attached to sin, like there's a lot of shame in that because yeah. you spend so much of your time trying to make sure nobody knows. And then you become the guy who's like, I can't believe people look at porn mm -hmm. because you don't want anybody to think you might. And, and it just... It, it gets, it's hard. Um, so I, I don't know that married women, especially like in the church, would report as much as if they did have a problem. Um, I, I just don't know. But I do b agree that, that women do look at pornography and women look at visual pornography and women aren't just looking at romance novels. And, and, I, and I think there's a matter of access involved. And sometimes we get to doing like weird moral theology thinking in our heads and we give ourselves permission to do things but not other things and then men are listening to romance novels because then they're not watching porn or like a lot of a lot of men i know watch cartoon porn or hentai porn mm -hmm. because they think because they've heard this argument that it violates that person and that's somebody's daughter right. and don't do that well well that's not somebody's daughter it's a drawing mm -hmm. and so somehow that's better mm -hmm. than that right yeah. even though it's still an attachment to lust and it's still like it's still being enslaved to lust right, right. um but we but we do these things to justify and and so i know men who read lit erotic literature and and they do it a lot of times because they don't want to watch visual pornography but they read erotic erotic literature um and and women do the other uh, i do think like women can be more attached to or, or the wound they have can be more of a relational wound th that they're aware of mm-hmm um, I think men have relational wounds too. They're just not as aware of them. Hmm. And because most of the time in recovery work, they become aware of a relational wounds where they thought there were none. An analogy I heard Dr. Marianne Layden use is just because something is less bad than something else, it doesn't make it healthy. Exactly. So even if you even if you say, well, I masturbate and that's better than masturbating with porn. I masturbate without it. It's like, okay, but still not healthy. Yeah, it doesn't mean it's healthy. Like right. Like a Twinkie is not healthy if you take the stuffing out of it. Yeah, right, right. right. Like it's still or bad. Or if you for say, you. "Well, I ate ten for the last week." Every so I'm day, only going to eat one. I'm, exactly, and that's that's less bad. It's like so I'm healthy. yeah, <laughs> right. but yeah, yeah. Maybe a break. Sure, let's take a break, and then I know we got a lot of people in the chat, hundreds of people watching right now. Um, we'll come back and we'll take some questions. That Sound sounds good? great. Yeah, thanks. All right, I wanna say thank you to two of our sponsors, the first being Homeschool Connections. If you are a parent who is homeschooling or who is considering homeschooling, you need to check out homeschoolconnections.com slash Matt. There is a link in the description below. This is an amazing program. Uh, it is 100% Catholic, so all of the teachers are faithful to the magisterium of the church, and the teachers are really sensational. Imagine your kid being taught apologetics by Trent Horn from Catholic Answers, or Tim Staples from Catholic Answers, or being taught uh, literature by people like Joseph Pierce. It's really great. They have live and interactive courses that meet in real time. They also have recorded independent learning courses that can be taken on your schedule. Also, the prices are really good, so you can continue to do homeschooling on a budget. Homeschoolconnections.com slash Matt. Again, link in the description below. Please check these guys out and make sure you go to homeschoolconnections.com slash Matt so that they know that we sent you. Yeah, they have a parent community uh, for meaningful connections to other parents just like you, so it's not just something you show to your children. It's something that you as a parent are engaging in as well. Homeschoolconnections.com slash Matt. I also want to say thank you to Hallo. Hallo is a really amazing app that will help you to pray and to meditate. I've been advertising these guys for a few years now, and they just keep getting better and better and better. I actually downloaded the app the other day because I got a new phone, so it was off my phone, and I bought the year subscription, and I've been really loving it. It leads you through rosary uh, meditations or Lexio Divinas or night examines. It even has sleep stories from people like Jonathan Rumi from The Chosen or Father Mike Schmitz or, yes, myself, but whatever. You don't have to listen to that one. Um, it's really, really excellent. And I'd encourage you to go check it out. Hello.com slash Matt Frad. And when you sign up there at hello.com slash Matt Frad, you'll get a month free to everything on the app. Now, you can just download the app and you'll get free 
you know, free, certain, certain things will be free, but not all of it. But if you want access to the entire app, so you can just try it out and see if you want to, you know, use this to pray with, hello.com slash Matt Frad. That's H-A-L-L-O-W.com slash Matt Frad. They are the number uh, one app on iTunes as far as Catholic apps are concerned. You know, there's a, there's a lot of these apps that help you to meditate and things like this, but they're new agey, you know, or they, they just teach false things, or they just lead you into that kind of way of thinking. This isn't like that. 100% Catholic, really well produced. Hello.com slash Matt Frad. Hello.com slash Matt Frad. And then finally, I would just like to ask you if you would consider supporting us at pintswithaquinas.com slash give. You can give directly, or you can you know, uh, go to Patreon and give there. We're trying to raise money for a full-time video guy. And we're also trying to launch our Pints with Aquinas Espanol channel, which will be called Tequila Con Aquino. So if you're enjoying this work and you want to throw us a few bucks every month, that really adds up and we really appreciate it. All right, back to the interview. Good. All right, welcome back. Now, a few things I want to mention before we get into questions here from our patrons, uh, and that is uh, a couple of resources. One is strive21.com, which is a 21-day dedoctrine porn course that me and Covenant Eyes have put together. 100% free for men. You can check that out. Another is a book I wrote called The Porn Myth, which is a non-religious response to pro-porn arguments. You get on Amazon. You get on Audible. Um, there's an app I created called Victory, uh, which is kind of a way to break free of porn. It shows you how many minutes and hours and days and months you've been free of porn. You can put kind of accountability partners in there so that if you feel triggered or tempted, you click a button and your your accountability partner gets a notification on their phone. Those would be just like a couple of resources. What would you suggest? Uh, I'd also suggest, that, as I've talked about, 12-step groups, and you can go to sa.org to find um, both in, in person and virtual meetings. Um, Bloom for Catholic Women dot com we already talked about um and uh and and there's a again jay stringer's book unwanted is very good Mm. uh kevin skinner's got two different books um treating pornography addiction and um treating i think it's called treating sexual addiction a compassion based approach which is his new book um and and so those are some things to get started and uh and again like the biggest resource is finding a person to to really disclose your life to who is going to be able to walk with you all right uh we'll take some questions here from our patrons noah anderson says is there a specific prayer in the face of temptation either of you finds effective also is there a way to kind of withdraw from that temptation or a way to remember to pray in those situations where temptation grabs a hold right so so one thing would be like to do fire drills and fire drills is like okay i i know when i'm tempted i'm tempted when i go jogging i'm tempted when i go to the gym i'm tempted at these so so i need a fire drill so i'm going to practice this i'm going to make a list like i go to the gym i'm going to say this prayer when i go to the gym this is what i'm going to do to make sure i'm not looking around like stuff like that um like one prayer i think is it's it's again it's a prayer from experience of of many people is just like jesus help me to find in you what i'm looking for in this right like so, so if I'm looking for affirmation, if I'm looking for somebody who thinks I'm amazing, like help me to find that, like help me to be find that affirmation in you, right? Like Lord, help me to find in you what I'm looking for in this person or going to this website or doing this behavior. Um, and, or like Jesus, I offer you this fantasy, mm-hmm. you know, like Jesus, I offer you the life where I made out with that girl back in high school. And I just invite you into my life right here, right now to meet me where I am and walk me into the future. Um, and, and to just make it really simple and relational with our Lord. So, so it's not so much, um, like, I, like I do also like recommend repenting right away. So like I catch myself in fantasy or like maybe I catch myself going off in my head in detraction about somebody I have a resentment against and just like catching myself and okay, I'm going to do an act of contrition right now. <laughs> All right. And I'm going to repent of that and ask for healing and move on. Um, and, and I think doing acts of contrition when we catch ourselves as well, like I'm going to surrender this to God and do an act of contrition. Um, and those are some things that we can do like in the moment and, and to practice doing it in the moment. And the more, and then we develop a habit of, 
like I caught myself and co- okay, now I'm going to do this. And, and especially when we start moving the line of, I can'ts, right. When we start yeah. moving that thing and like, Oh, I caught myself on a second glance, Jesus, I offer you this and I'm going to make an act of contrition and I'm going to move on. Mm. Yeah. Something I've found helpful is saying the word trigger out loud. If I find myself triggered, it almost wakes up the sleeping brain that mm-hmm. may have just gone down this dead end road. I just, I'll say trigger. <laughs> And I also think uh, offering a prayer that Christopher West has taught in his books, something like, Lord, I thank you for this woman, her beauty, and may I never look upon her as an object to to be used, but as a person to be loved. And I think that prayer does two things. It sort of, again, wakes us up from that sort of sleepy thing, Mm -hmm. Uh, but it also... um, It it affirms the beauty that I'm I'm seeing. It's not dismissing it. Um, And it also kind of, in a way... uh, uh, reintegrates what pornography tears asunder, body and soul, mm-hmm. this person. And and if I even have memories that kind of come back from things that I've seen, I'll actually ask myself some questions. Like, I wonder what she's doing now. Uh, I wonder what show she likes on Netflix. Right. I wonder what her relationship with her parents are like. And just by asking those questions to myself, I'm humanizing what porn dehumanized for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A lot of people really find the Jesus prayer very simple and effective too which is just jesus christ have mercy on me jesus christ have mercy on me jesus christ and just until it passes and and to Mm. just repeat that over and over and over again you might take your rosary beads and just do the jesus prayer Mm -hmm. and and, you know it's kind of more of an eastern tradition thing there's a book called um the way of a pilgrim right Mm -hmm. and and it's really a beautiful reflection on the jesus prayer yeah all right. We have another question here from Ethan McHenry. And again, some of these questions were asked prior to the talk, so sure. they may not apply or you can take another run at them. Ethan McHenry says, are there any particular devotions you can recommend that are helpful in reducing lustful temptations? Yeah, so again, I would say like doing the Jesus prayer and lustful temptations come because of a deprivation, right? So so like part of a lustful temptation is that there's a deprivation that I used to fill with lust. And my brain has associated my grief with lust or my brain has associated sadness with lust. And so my brain goes into automatic thinking. And automatic thinking is it presents a temptation because that's when the evil one comes in and says, see, you're not really better and, and you're horrible and like you're like never going to get over. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I'm going to renounce that. And and then to just continue to, to work at being in relationship with our Lord. Um, so, so the devotion is really about like, like placing yourself within our Lord's love, or meditating on our Lord's face, you know. And 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 I, I found that very helpful when I go to make my holy hour, is to because my brain will be going in all these directions, and then to just stop and say like, Jesus, what do you want to say to me? And just to like try to picture His face, and then see where He leads me, mm-hmm. right? Which is a very different thing than than where I want to go. And, and his thing is often more, just, it's just simpler and, and more loving. Mm. Um, Wesley Novak, thanks for being a patron, Wesley. He says, what can one do with sexual energy when you are not called to be married? A lot of the porn recovery material seems to assume being married at some point. Huh, you'd be a good one to answer this, given that you are not married. I am not married. So sexual energy. Um, I wonder if that needs to be critiqued. I, I, I don't know, because I'm not a sexologist. So so I don't really, I have right. my own experience of sexual energy. Sure. I also know that my sexual energy was higher when I was sexually acting out more. And like in my 20s. And, and now I'm in my late 40s and maybe I have some old age, you know, kicking in or high cholesterol that's cutting off blood flow. I don't know. <laughs> um, but, but, I, but I would say that like, like being in peace like helps to reduce and dissipate that. There, there's always things like, you know, you should exercise and you should eat right and you shouldn't like, you should stay away from eating like junk food all the time because sometimes it just gives you too much energy and and your body has a habit of maybe burning it off when you act out um so so i think there's those traditional answers like mm. like you know that's where go for a run things like that um but also like learning to be at peace and and learning to calm yourself and and so like catholic mindfulness that um dr greg mm-hmm. bataro uh, really promotes is, is a way of just calming yourself because the the sexual energy sometimes again it's a response to 
um, whatever else is going on in your emotional life. You know, for, for somebody, I had them just start journaling every day. Um, like, what was my primary feeling today? Um, what did I do well today? What do I need right now that's not being met? Um, what do I need to take ownership for? Like, where do I need to apologize? Or where did I fall short? You know, and how is my sobriety or how is my sexual energy? And you might find that, like, mm. when you have certain feelings, your sexual energy is higher. And it just helps you learn, like, like there, maybe there's something more here than just a biological drive. Mm -hmm. and, and so we want to look at all of those things to reduce that. You know, because because again, automatic thinking, it, it's a habit of the mind that we have that's not a sin. And, and this is something I think it's important to clarify that like automatic thoughts are not a sin and and automatic thinking happens to us. So so like and this becomes a pitfall for many people. So like an example might be I go I go jogging and, and this beautiful woman jogs by me. And I'm just like, man, she's a beautiful woman. I wonder if she would think that I'm attractive. Like, what if I went up and jogged next to her and we started to chat a little bit and, and then, and then we might jog together and then, and then we might stop at juice stop and get a juice. And, and then we might talk for a while and then we might run out of time and, and then we could end up like, oh my gosh, we're out of time. And so I'm going to have to go back to her place to shower. And we're just going to save time by showering together. Wait, what am I thinking? Like what's going on? Yeah. What, right. Have I committed a sin yet? Like, have I given consent yet? Mm -hmm. No. You're you asking me? No. Yeah, asking. Yes, no, no you haven't. I haven't given consent. Therefore, right. I'm not in the area of sin. Right. But at that moment of realizing, mm -hmm. now, I have a, now I'm at the moment of consent, and that's exactly. the battlefield. That's, that's a great way to right? point out where that moment is. Once right. you realize, oh, am I... You know, like, am I giving consent to this? As soon as you've read that's that. That's where you're at the moment. Yeah. And then you can either surrender that to God. Jesus, I offer you the life where I jogged by that girl and we went back to her house. <laughs> and I just invite you into my loneliness and my jog. Or, or, or I go ahead and give consent. And if I give consent to that fantasy, I'm probably going to act out later. Yep. So, so what happens, the pitfall is that people reach that moment of consent and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm such a horrible person and I can't believe I'm thinking that and I'm not really a real Christian. And, and if I was a real Christian, I wouldn't even have these thoughts and like the devil's like on my back and God's not here for me and I might as well act out because I'm already sinned and I got to go to confession anyways, right? Like, and then they fall. So because the, like that moment of cons the, that's where that moment is. All that other stuff is this junk and memory. Mm -hmm. And and it's important to name it that that's junk and memory. And and I'm just going to give that to God and and then I'm going to move on with my life. Um but I point that out because so many people they think like oh I've already done you know they think they've already sinned when they haven't. And then that becomes the primary temptation to mm -hmm. like commit Keep the grave going. sin. Yeah. And and to this point, what can I do with all this sexual energy? And this has been my personal experience, again, not a sexologist, and that would be, well, the one thing that won't work is to then engage in, you know, sinful sexual activity. That's that won't get rid of your sexual no, energy. It'll, it'll, as it'll it spike it. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if it were the case that acting out sexually got rid of your sexual energy, then there shouldn't porn addict shouldn't exist. Because you would get that hit, and then you, your sexual energy would be we, right. we dealt with. But. Yeah, there's a natural way that your body gets rid of sexual energy called a wet dream. Yeah, and and like people should like in recovery, like you should just start having wet dreams. And and again, this is an important thing because a lot of people don't know that, or they've I've met I've met with like 40 year old men who have never had a wet dream in their entire life because they've always masturbated. Right. But like men have wet dreams like about every month or two. Uh, if you don't act out, if you're not in a sexual relationship, yeah. it's going to be every month or two, you're going to have a wet dream. Mm -hmm. And that's just God's reward. Like Benedict Groeschel would say, like, that's God's reward for living a chaste life. Yeah. And, <laughs> and it's not a sin. Yeah, and Thomas Aquinas addresses this in the Sumas. He his does, right? Aquinas. And it's yeah. not a sin. And sometimes right. people read Thomas Aquinas and they're like, yeah, but he says it could be a sin in all these cases. And so you have to examine your... Con like, don't... If you're an addict and you have a wet dream have a party like celebrate it like you haven't had one in a long time it means you're being sober have a wet dream party and <laughs> that is a like, party i don't know what to go to okay <laughs> like it's kind of a joke right? i'm saying that on purpose <laughs> yeah I'm yeah. sure that'll be the clip that gets cut. Some, <laughs> That's somebody who doesn't do. like me will cut that clip. Uh, Greg Bauer says, since men are visually stimulated, what ways have been found to convert our heart to tame this intrinsic nature? Assuming it is intrinsic. 
Okay, since men are visually stimulated, what... Ways have been found to convert our heart to tame this intrinsic nature. I don't really understand. Yeah, um, so so I think that, again, like, you're visually stimulated. Like, you see things more, right? Because, I don't know, maybe it made us better hunters and things like that. Okay. And, and, like, men tend to, like, pick up on things visually. And, and, okay, that's a gift, and it's also a liability. And so you just have to take ownership for the fact that that's a liability. Um, like, some people, like, some people have made the argument that like if you just look at beauty all the time you know that's going to help you Mm. um again i don't know that many people with long-term sustained sobriety that got sober because every time they acted out they went and sat in a beautiful church and looked at it like so but but i do know this that when you get sober you start to see beauty in a more profound way and you appreciate it in a more profound way and then that is preferable to looking at pornography Mm. and and you know i had that experience after like being completely addicted to television in rome and i was going to saint peter's every day and then i went home and went to therapy and i hadn't watched television like four months and i walked into saint peter's and i was like what this place is amazing wow you know it's amazing in here and it struck me and another young man i was working with he he had three months of sobriety and he came in and he was like father See how blue the sky is today? It's like really blue and the trees are really green and women are super beautiful. And I'm like, yeah, like that's what you've been missing because you've been asleep and now you're awake, Mm. right? Like you've been asleep and now you're awake. And and like the cataracts have been taken from your eyes, like in the book of Tobit. And, And you can see things more clearly. And then the beauty of creation in sobriety, the beauty of creation like calms the heart. Right? And it gives peace to the heart. When we're not in sobriety, we don't even notice the beauty of mm. creation. Uh, Edward Chandler, thanks for being a patron, Edward, asks, you mentioned a demon of abuse and demon of muteness. Is there obvious similar demonic activity with regard to pornography that is widespread over and beyond ordinary diabolic temptation? So I'm also not an exorcist. So I think that would be a great sure. question to ask an exorcist about the ties between pornography and the demonic. Uh, the most common right influence of demons is what? Temptation. Mm-hmm. All right. That's the most common demo- dem- demonic influence that we encounter. Um, becoming obs- like obsession. Um, I have heard people talk about like certain websites that they believe like are cursed and 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 then and just that pull on our heart that happens um and but but also like demons attach themselves to wounds and and when wounds are healed it seals off the access point you know which is why like like somebody can go get deliverance ministry and then and the demon leaves and then seven more come back you know we sweep the house clean and seven more come back if we don't heal the wounds right which is why again like it's a comprehensive approach to things. So, so you do deliverance ministry, but then like that gives you a boost so that you have the courage to go to group every day and go to counseling and like deal with your stuff and deal with your life and integrate your life mm-hmm. so that you close off the access points that the evil one uses. Patron Grant Reddick says, this priest rocks. Uh, Thanks, Grant. (laughs) And I'm so glad you brought him on the show. A talk of his was quite impactful to me, and he is giving a ton of great insights on here. Thanks, Matt. Francesco Borgoni says, in your opinion, what should we do besides praying when a friend doesn't want to change, is leaving the faith and the church, and is not interested at all in stopping his pornography addiction and living a virtuous life? Can this friendship continue, considering Aristotle's definition of friendship? St. Paul has some very harsh words regarding these types of brothers, and honestly, it's hard for me to accept them. Withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Since I have already tried the admonishment during these years, what should I do? Hmm. So, uh, so I, I, I'm just gonna. This is just me giving, you know, a little bit of advice. Like I'm not. It's not canonical or anything like that. Mm-hmm. But I, I think when I've been in those situations. Um, the the thing i pray for is that they will have the circumstances in their life that they need to bring about a realization of their dependence on god 
And, and so sometimes it means that we're praying that they, that they hit bottom soon. And a merciful way of saying that is mm-hmm. I pray that they hit, that they have a low bottom, right? Yeah. You know, or I pray that they have a higher high bottom, bottom yeah. a high bottom. I pray that yeah, they yeah. have a high bottom. And, uh, but, but sometimes the only thing we can do is just ask our Lord to do whatever it takes in order to win his heart. And if we're not the person that's going to be able to change their heart because maybe because of a friendship or because of a long-term relationship, Jesus, I need you to send him whoever he needs in order to change his heart, All right? Because you love him and you want him to be in relationship with God. But there's something in his life, there's some like belief system or, or love privation or affirmation, depri- like something that that is preventing him from wanting joy. And... Uh, and I do believe, like, think the words of just St. John of the Cross are really appropriate there, which is where there is no love, put love, and there will be love. You know, and, and so some... It sounds so like a means, passive-aggressive response to somebody yeah. who's complaining there's not enough love. I know, where there's no love, put, they just put, put it love, there and then it'll and be, there. be love. <laughs> it's right? great, yeah. So you see this person where there's no love, and so you're going to place love there, and, and you're just going to continue to love them anyways, and, and hopefully um, that starts to move their heart. You know, you can not talk to them for the rest of his life but but you also have to be in a place where like you're going to be okay mm. if he says no to you you know like you're free enough in your relationship with our lord that you can go and be vulnerable with that person they can say f you i don't want to be your friend and you're going to be okay mm. what do you say too about taking a holistic interest in a person's life as opposed to just seeing them as a project and this part of them needs to be fixed and that's the bit you fixate on every time you're around them because i think people fall into that trap too yeah, I think that's a bad idea. Like we should always see the whole person in front of us, and and then when people feel like they're a project, um, that's uh, it just doesn't invite friendship because friendship means that I want to know all of you, yeah. you know, and I'm and I'm going to love all of you no matter what's going on in your life, and and sometimes we have a compulsion to fix people and. Not that I've ever had one of those, you know, Either. or any priest has ever had, right? Like, like we, that's why we became priests because we like to fix people. Yeah. Um, but, but eventually we learn like our Lord can do that and I can't. Mm. Thomas Johnson says, I understand that habit reduces the gravity of sin and possibly makes a venial sin that would otherwise be mortal. At the same time, I do not want to receive the sacrament unworthily. How can one know if one is in a fit state to receive communion regards the topic of habitual sin? I attend confession regularly, once or twice a fortnight. Okay, so you can know that you are fit to receive confession, to receive communion if you just went to confession. That's how you can know. Um, so, so my whole thing, uh, like Father Harvey treats this too, where he talks about how like a mortal sin could be venial because there's a habit, there's a compulsion. It's in the Catechism of the Catholic Church that in the paragraph on masturbation, right? That masturbation is an intrinsically and gravely disordered action, but because of these factors, Mm -hmm. it reduces culpability. My advice is always this, that if you have committed that thing, right? If you committed a grave action, you should not go to communion until you go to confession and you just like fast from receiving the Eucharist that day. If you're enslaved to sin, I don't know how efficacious receiving communion is anyways because you're enslaved to sin. And and if you're habituated, you're enslaved to sin. What I've seen happen is people take that as permission giving and then they start to change the definition of mortal sin. And then they think masturbation is not a mortal sin. Like this is, this not, I can go to communion. That's no big deal. Mm-hmm. And I have a habit or I had a guy come into group once and he said, my priest basically told me that it's impossible for me to commit a mortal sin right now. So why am I here? Like, what do I want to do here? Because here I might get free and then I'm responsible. <laughs> and, and so, so it just slows people mm-hmm. down in their recovery when they receive communion and they're doing moral theology in their head to figure out that they're not really in mortal sin, they're in venial sin. And, and it's not helpful because, because the goal is, <laughs> the goal is freedom. It's not to juggle around in our head, like, like where I'm at, even though I'm committing an intrinsically disordered action, mm-hmm. you know? So, so if, so that's my advice is what I call maintaining Eucharistic integrity, which means if you fall into masturbation or pornography, you absent yourself from communion until you go to confession. Right. That also should put a little more urgency 
uh, and maybe a little more of an I can't do that anymore in your sort of mental ratio about that behavior. Mm. What advice do you give to someone who acts out sexually and then thinks, well, I may as well get a few more free ones in before I get to, to, to the sacrament? Because it's just as embarrassing to say, I fornicated or masturbated or looked at sure. pornography three times than it is once, so I've already screwed this up, may as well keep going. Yeah, I would say you're not alone. <laughs> like, that's, yeah. everybody thinks that, right? Yeah. Like, lots of people think that. Uh, I'd also say that that is definitively an attitude of despair. And, um, and that should also be part of what you're looking at as you're examining your conscience. And, and if you, if you, there's a part of you that thinks like, like, this is like, you know, when people want to quit smoking though, so they smoke two cartons of cigarettes in a day and then they never want a cigarette again. Like it doesn't work that way, you know, like, like you'll probably end up going back again. So, um, so I would just encourage people to like, like they fall and they realize like, ugh why did I do that? I just wanted to do that. Okay. Maybe I forgot I was an addict. Like I forgot I can't go to Amazon and look up boob movies. I forgot. Um, sometimes we just forget like, Oh, I forgot I'm an addict. I forgot I can't do that. Mm. Um, and, uh, and then just go to confession, right. And just like cut it off. And, um, and I would also say like, if you're in that place, like you probably need more help than just going to confession. Mm. Uh, we'll take some questions here from YouTube live stream. Dr. Thomas Raspberry says, uh, how would you compare finding a spiritual father confessor for individual guidance compared to 12 step given 12 step tendencies to recognized higher powers? Not exactly our God. Yeah. So like I would say that finding a spiritual father is a necessity in all cases. Right. And, and so, but when people find a spiritual director, typically their spiritual director is just someone who is going to like meet with them once a month. Yep. Um, most spiritual directors are not going to meet with you every week. Most spiritual directors are not going to take your phone call every day. And again, when you go to a 12 step group, like it talks about a higher power, which for anybody who's Catholic is Jesus Christ who founded the Catholic church. You know, for somebody else, it might be a doorknob. That's fine. I don't care whatever works but like it it's not a it shouldn't be seen as an impediment most catholics i know who have gone to 12 step found out that they had they were able to develop a much deeper relationship with our lord because they had never really gone through a process of surrendering their life to jesus even though they go to mass every sunday because there was a part of their heart that ha they hadn't given them because mm. if they'd given them all of their heart they wouldn't be an addict anymore and, and so, and at a 12 step group, you're going to find a guy who's going to say, I want you to call me every single day. If you can find that guy in your church and he actually knows how to be faithful, like find him, do it. Um, but, but I just haven't found that in, in most parishes, like we don't know who that guy is mm -hmm. because he's in a 12 step room. Uh, we have a question here from Jonas. He says, any advice on dealing with pride that seeps in with greater lengths of sobriety? Yeah, uh, again, this is where I think going to a 12-step group is really effective because that's what you're talking about. And, and like the whole program is designed to help like break down your pride. And like when you have to sit in a room and say like everything you ever tried to do to stop and failed and, and you have to admit and you're reminded every single day that you can't do this by yourself, that you need God to be free. Um, that can be helpful. The minute you think I've got this, you're probably going to relapse. And, mm. and so, so you're trying to build a sense of gratitude and gratitude is the opposite of pride. Right. And so, so like when you get to the end of your day and you're sober, like, do you thank Jesus for keeping you sober today? You know, you develop that habit in certain recovery circles, but, but I don't, I don't know if we always promote that, you know, like, like at the end of the day, when you do your night prayers, if you got through the day and you're sober and, and you're free and you're just like, thank you, Jesus, for keeping me sober today. You can work on the little way of St. Therese, you know, and just thank you, Jesus, for helping me to brush my teeth this morning. And thank you, Jesus, for, because that is what cuts away pride is gratitude for everything because mm. God is the primary cause of everything mm. in our lives. 
and to show gratitude for that because then nothing's about me. Um, Amdemo, thank you for asking the question here. He says, you mentioned intimacy with God in prayer earlier, but God hasn't a body like you and me. No laughing, hugging, talking. How can we as social animals be imp- Im- uh, intimate with God who's so different to us? It's a good question. It is a good question. And so, so like, <clears throat> remember that God does have a body in the second person of the Trinity who became man, right? Like we believe in the incarnation. That's what makes us different is that Jesus actually has a body and, and Jesus actually had a face that he left behind in things like the Shroud of Turin, you know, and, and that he has a face in mm-hmm. the Blessed Sacrament that's exposed in the monstrance in many of our churches. And it's not the same thing as looking into the eyes of that one girl that you just really have a crush on. Uh, but, but there is a way of praying in which like we sit and we allow him to communicate his life and his love to us. And, and sometimes it takes some time, but learning to do Ignatian prayer with scripture where you visualize yourself in a gospel scene mm-hmm. and, and you notice how our Lord notices you. You know, you notice how our Lord notices you. And, and what's really beautiful is when, like, he shows you something that was unexpected that day. You know, like, like last year I was on my retreat, I was focused on, like, the disciples and being friends with the disciples. And, and, uh, and so my first one prayer session was, like, Peter or Andrew and the other disciple was John the Baptist and, and Jesus walks by. And, and so when in my prayer, the way I saw it was like, they were sort of talking to John the Baptist and, and Andrew looks up and he's like, who's that dude staring at me? And, and he keeps talking to John the Baptist and then he looks up at again and he's like, there's some dude staring at me. <laughs> and, and he keeps going, and why is he looking at me? And then he goes to John the Baptist and he says, who's that guy looking at me? And John the Baptist says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And then Andrew has this realization that the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world has noticed him, right? Noticing is the first thing that happens in building a relationship. And then that moves his heart and he goes after him. And, and Jesus turns around and he's like, what do you want? <laughs> Where do you stay? I just want you to keep noticing me. And, and my prayer was sort of just about like how that happened. And, and then another prayer session, it was like the wedding feast of Cana. And I was sitting around with all the disciples and Jesus was somewhere. And, and we were all like, I, so I was going around the room and I was like, how did you get here? And then just listening to like Andrew tell me a story and, and like, how did you get here? And like, yeah, I was like a mess. And then I found John the Baptist and then, and then, and then Jesus came. And then they said, how did you get here? And, and then I just kind of told my story of like all the places Jesus entered mm. into my life. Mm. And then this year it was really a, like the coolest thing was I was praying with my relationship with Mary and, and like I'm, so I'm in the same scene with the disciples at the wedding because of Cana and, uh, and we're talking about all these things. And then I noticed that Mary is attentive and Mary's noticing this conversation going mm-hmm. on and, and we're about to wrap things up. And so she goes and tells Jesus to make more wine to extend that time. It, you know, and it's just like, is that historically what happened? No. Is our Lord communicating something to me about like Mary's attentiveness in my life and that the fact that she really cares about me and that she notices everything that happens and that I can count on her and that like she holds me in her heart like Mm -hmm. yes and is that what we believe as catholic christians yes and did i have an experience of intimacy there yes like like we can grow in that yeah you know something else that struck me when he's saying he's not here because he just responded and said but he's not here like you and me again i think it's a fine point but something that struck me in that's that i would rather be in relationship with my wife over email than i would with you in person no offense i love you right Mm -hmm. but it would mean more to me to receive a letter from my wife and i would feel more loved and received by that than you and i hugging and hanging out and laughing together well why is that it's because well there's a greater level of intimacy to begin with even though i can't smell her or see her and i think it's similar with our lord i mean it's right it's true it's not the same but the intimacy is greater. Right. And there and there is a like lot of loneliness in that question, you know, and and, and a desire for real intimacy and sometimes we have natural desire for that and you know, like I like I have a lot of loneliness. Like I go to bed at night by myself every single day and you know, I'm like hugging a body pillow with a weighted blanket over me, you know. So I'm like <laughs> yeah. giving a hug and getting a hug at the same time. Um <laughs> that's what you have to do when you're celibate. I do it too. Um, we have weighted blankets. And, and so yeah, and so shit. like so sometimes those things are like physiological things that can help us, but but there is like growing in intimacy with him and, and also like growing in real friendship really like helps cut against that kind of loneliness. Um, and, and like having friends in our life who, who we realize really matter to us. And, Mm -hmm. and so, so I, there, there are, 
there are paths. Otherwise, every single celibate person would be completely miserable all the time, and that's just not true. I yeah. love your honesty, by the way, and I just think it's something we can all learn from. I think sometimes there's that we, we're afraid of our desires and we're afraid of like what might be bubbling up, and so we pretend it's not there. But just to hear you say something like that, you know, like to joke about, like this is what you have to do when you celibate, but it's also kind of not a joke, right? It's mm -hmm. like, no, it's absolutely true. I yeah. love that. Yeah, and like and this and this is what we should all really be like, you know. It's mm -hmm. yeah. There's probably somebody out there that I really admire that sleeps on a board every day, and you know, and, and <laughs> their cassock, like wearing their cassock. Um, but is it a weighted cassock? That's not that's what I, <laughs> like, I don't. I, I I just like I like hugging like my fifth pillow at night sometimes. Yeah. And it's it's like the Harlow's monkeys, you know. They like the like the furry thing. Now this is this is a really good question. Mm -hmm. um, I want to discern the priesthood, but mm -hmm. this problem makes me feel unworthy. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice? Yeah, my advice is, if you have this problem, get help. That's my advice. Okay, quick story. Dude calls me. He's in college. He's got a porn problem. Okay, take an assessment. Had him take an assessment. He's definitely an addict. Give, him a, you give me a call, and I'll start walking with you. Never heard from him. Year later... He wants to go to the seminary. He's doing Exodus 90. He's got 45 days. So the vocations director, of course, says, well, he's not an addict. Okay, 45 days on Exodus 90 does not mean you're not an addict. Um, tell him to call me. He calls me. I said, look, you got three months. This is what I want you to do. I want you to go to an essay meeting every single day until you go to the seminary. 90 meetings, 90 days. You got three months. I also want you to do this My House Intensive for Men. Our next one's coming up. And I want you to go on that and then, and then go to the seminary. The dude's been free for a year and a half yeah. as a seminarian. Like he's never fallen in the seminary because he did all that stuff mm -hmm. before he went in. And he's like, awesome. So like you can get better. You just have to be willing to do what it takes to get better. I think this, that's such an important thing to say because I think there's a cynicism that settles in when you try and fail and try right. and fail again. You look at people like you right now and you might say something like, okay, sure, maybe it's possible for some people or maybe you're just making this up because you're a priest who talks about porn so you have to pretend that you're healed or whatever. But you probably have secrets just like I have secrets and everyone has secrets and everyone's really looking at porn and sure. it's just such a pessimistic response, but I get it. I get it too and and I hope that I seem, you know, kind of like a happy person that I feel really good to be, you know, I'm, I'm like filled with joy beholding you and, uh, thank you for beholding me. <laughs> being, being together again. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's easy to fall into that pessimism, but I, I can tell you that it's true. Like I can tell you that I know people who are free and, and I've seen people become free and, and I'm telling you what they did to be free because that's my, that's my like interior promise to anybody who listens to me talk is I'm not going to tell you something works unless I know it works. You know, like I'm not going to tell you like he put covenant eyes on his phone and never looked at porn again. Like I don't know anybody with that story. Um, there might be people with that story. I just don't know them, you know? Um, but, but I do know that like this story works. So if you have shame about, I want to go to the seminary, but I have this problem, like you just get help for the problem. You know, the seminary is not like a magic thing, you know, like some people think when you get the sacrament of holy orders, part of the grace of the sacrament is blood stops flowing to your genitals. Like, like they think people that's think what that's, happens. People think that about marriage um, in regards to other regard women, to other like women you'll stop finding other like women that. attractive. Yeah, like the grace of the sacrament of marriage is that you'll never find anybody else to be beautiful, right? <laughs> yeah. Like that's not, That'd be that's, awful. Not in yeah. the, that's not in, described in the graces of the sacrament, I don't think, in the catechism, yeah, that makes right? It doesn't say like the bond <laughs> of marriage and fruitfulness and like you'll never find anybody attractive. Everybody else becomes ugly, right? Like that doesn't happen because we have to be free to love, right? And free to love means I choose you and I say no to everybody else, right? I say no to everybody else and I say yes to you. Yeah. And if they were... If they all became ugly because of matrimony, then it wouldn't be much it's of a sacrifice. Really a choice. It's not a choice <laughs> between two goods then, <laughs> yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. So. Yeah. Yes, that's really good. Oh, you just said something that I thought was really important. I wanted to follow up on. And then I laughed and forgot all about it. Oh, here's what I was going to say. Uh, I get what you're saying, that you don't want to promote something that, that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. But some things can help, if yeah, not Yeah, they can be work. helpful. Right. So be helpful. you would obviously, I'm sure, maybe I'm not sure, but you would encourage people to get covenantized, even if the story of I got covenantized and never looked at porn again is yeah, not one I Yeah, I would I say get covenantized. 
and see if it works for you. But don't think that that's the one thing. And then if it doesn't work for you, you're hopeless. Mm -hmm. Right? That's what I don't want. I don't want people mm -hmm. to think like, oh, I got covenant eyes and it didn't work. So that's like no good. It's like when people go to therapy, you know, I went to therapy and my therapist didn't help me. So therapy in general <sighs> is bad. Right. It yeah. just means you didn't connect with that person. Go get a new therapist. Right. Like they work for you. And, and if you go through six, it might be you. You know, you might be the problem. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. And and so just to keep your options open to to the plethora of pathways that our Lord might give you. And and so um, and there's really no magic bullets. Mm. You know, there's no magic bullets. I think like the, like these fundamental things are fundamental things. And, and then there's like other things like like I would say my own journey includes 12 step work, therapy, inner healing prayer going on a Bob Shoots retreat, um, doing an, an Ignatian retreat, doing another Ignatian retreat. Like, like there's all these things that our Lord did and, and they all have a significant role that they played in my life because all of our life is where our life is supposed to be in the mind of God. So like he, he knows where you are. Right. He knows where you are. And, and sometimes we're like that guy, you know, the, the joke of like, I asked God to save me and he sent me a boat. So I said no. And, and they sent me a helicopter, like, right? Like that thing, you know, but, but maybe like he's, he's offering you like this 12 step fellowship and, and you say no, but maybe mm. he, maybe it comes back around, you know, and, and, and all those things can be tools and, and we shouldn't like shut those down because there's a pride in us that wants to be healed in our own way. And if, if, if that's what we're attached to, we're probably mm. not going to be free. There's eight beatitudes. Blessed are the pure of heart is six. Blessed are the poor in spirit is one. Mm. <laughs> poor in spirit means I am completely powerless and I need God to do this for me. Mm -hmm. And that's the first thing. Oh, anything else you want to say before we begin to wrap up? I I don't think so. This has been great. How can people connect with you? Learn more from you. Uh, so so the, like online content basically like go to my YouTube channel so you can easily find it if okay. you search for my name. I'll, I'll put in a YouTube. we'll put a link in the top um, of the description. You can description also put a link this. in the description. I think it's even like you know YouTube forward slash c forward slash Father Sean Kilcally. Um, I, I, what I'm hoping I just became a pastor and, and so I'm really hoping that. Um, that I'm able to do things at my parish in this area um, or just in the area of like catechesis about love and marriage um, and uh, and then make them all like available, you know, on, on our parish website. Um, but that, that would be the primary way, right? And so it's just kind of Google my name. Mm -hmm. You can always reach out to me through like the email address. Um, I really hope to in the future have an ask the pastor button on our parish website so that people can just like click that and ask me a question. Mm -hmm. And then I can answer that either on YouTube or on in text and writing. Um, so, so that's the primary way. You know, I like I'm a priest first and that's, that's really what our Lord has put on my heart during COVID is that, you know, I found myself during COVID, not a pastor. All the pastors are busy trying to take care of their people. I was like in residence and sitting around and our Lord was like, I want you to spend more time with me. And I was like, I want to rewatch the Terminator. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and so it took me a while to respond to that. Um, but then, you know, the great gift of it was uh, just a lot of healing and just my own desire to be healthy. You know, like I got, I had, a, I had a, like a baby tooth in my mouth. I went to the dentist for the first time in like 11 years and yeah. now I've got an implant tooth and, ah. and I lost 30 pounds and I went on cholesterol medication and I got a sleep apnea machine. Like there's all kinds of health stuff. I'm violating all kinds of HIPAA rules, but, <laughs> but really it's sharing my joy because, uh, <laughs> because a very holy person um, who prays for me a lot and, and he just like wrote me and he was like, I'm just getting from our Lord that you might be sick or something's going on. And then it just moved me to go to the doctor and start taking care of my health. And, and I just, um, I'm just incredibly grateful for the way our Lord moved in that. And, uh, and so, yeah. And so then I ended up with at the end of COVID with a greater desire to, to be a pastor. And, and so I, I wrote my Bishop and he assigned me to St. Leo parish in Palmyra and St. Martin parish in Douglas, Nebraska, which are beautiful, small towns. So our parish is small, but mighty. Like that's the goal, right? We're going to yeah. be small, but mighty. Um, and, and they're just beautiful people and, and I'm, 
and our Lord has placed a great amount of love in my heart for them even before our mm. arriving there. And, and I just am so excited about what he might be doing, you know? Beautiful. And, and just looking for what our Lord's going to do next, right? Well, thank you. Thanks for taking the time to come on. I'm really glad. I was saying this is one of the cool things about being in Steubenville because when I was in Atlanta, getting these wonderful people on my show, I had to fly them to Atlanta, oh, sure. yeah. have them drive an hour from the airport to get to my house. Now it's like, ah, uh, there's millions of amazing people here always. So Yeah. yeah. So I would also just uh, in gratitude for the conference I was at at Steubenville mm. to uh, to just like invite people to check out the Veritas Amores project, right? So it's veritasamores.org. And, uh, and maybe even subscribe so that you can see like what they do next. You know, mm -hmm. it's just in its infancy, this project. And, and I really do believe that, that what they're doing is so important for the church's teaching on the human person, marriage and family. And, uh, and they're, again, they're all the people who, who really transform my life and, and, uh, and I owe everything, you know, about the ministry I do and everything to them. So, so that's very And, um, I'm not officially part of that. I'm not, I did, you know, I'm just plugging <laughs> yeah. it because it's a website you can subscribe to just to, um, to, to just, you know, read some journal articles or blogs from, from some incredibly smart people, um, who really, really uh, have a desire to preserve and to promote the church's teaching about who we are. Excellent. And is that it? Should we close with prayer and blessing? That'd or? be lovely. Okay. Please. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for the abundance of goodness that you've given to us for placing a desire for you in our hearts and ask your blessing upon each of us here in this room, each of, everyone who watches this on YouTube, those watching live and those who will watch in the future. Give us a desire for, for your love and place in our hearts the courage to, to be willing to do whatever it takes and to risk everything in order to have joy. To be the person who's going to go and sell everything and buy the field in order to have the treasure that's buried in the field. Or the pearl of great price. That we may truly glorify you <laughs> in the transformation that's evident in our lives each day. And through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Joseph, and all the saints, may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you.